What's going on over there? What are y'all doing? Is it a race? As soon as you guys finish your game, we got to start. Yeah. As I said, there's a room, right? <laughs> All right, everybody, um, if you can hear me and you're kind of around the outside or outside in the hallway, uh, we got to get started. I know that uh, fellowship is one of the big, big draws and big important things, and that is true, and there'll be plenty of time for that as well. Um, but to just get the teaching portion back going, as people come in and get seated, um, I'll, t I'll tell you about two things. Um, before introducing the next speaker. Um, over here in the corner, uh, we've got C.R. Cowley. Cowley and Cheryl are over here in the corner. They have their book, Doctrine of Balaam. Uh, now, most of the people in the room probably have gotten a hold of that at some point in time or heard about it, um, but you can pick up copies of that or any of the... They've got um, abolition t-shirts and other materials and resources over there. Just wanted to make sure people understood to go visit their table and their materials. And then on the opposite side to the left here, you'll see, and this is like the debut of the, you'll, you'll actually see the whole Silk family. It's like a, a Silk family circus over there, but a very well-behaved circus. Um, and this is Liberty Rising over here. And he'll be speaking to us um, towards the end of this session. Um, but particularly... Uh, pastors or those of you are in churches that you're trying to get um, your church involved, your church coming to the capital, that sort of thing. Um, Joseph has has just a heart to be able to go into a church and um, set up a time. Maybe it's like a Sunday evening or a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning, just whenever is good for that local fellowship to have him in. To, to speak and to train them to be better legislators, to not only understand abolitionism, but then how to get those people motivated. And when he told us about his organization, he said, man, I've, I, we need constituent pressure. And the pressure that the legislators are going to feel is when it's going to come from the churches in Oklahoma. And so those churches need to be trained. Those people need to be sent. And so if you're here particularly, I don't, you don't have to be a pastor to, to get the material and all that, but uh, if you'd like to speak with him, sign up a time. Um, I know that from speaking with him, he's, uh, he'll probably speak a little bit more about this, but sometimes it's easier when someone says it for you. Um, but I think he's willing to basically give up his Sundays to travel all over the state of Oklahoma to, to help move this cause along. So um, don't be shy. You know, he's like, oh, he's a former senator and he's wearing a suit. And he's got a beard like everybody else in the room. Um, but just go over there. There's materials. There's sign-up sheets. All of that. 
sometime today before we leave this room because tomorrow evening session is at is in a different location um, and I don't know if he'll be bringing his stuff over there but sign up with him get your church going all right so without further ado on all that kind of things is there any other announcements that I gotta do Josh is that it um, it's, it's a super pleasure of mine to be able to introduce people because I get to say all sorts of random, nice and strange things about them. Um, but um, you guys don't know how blessed the movement is in the conversion of James Silberman. Um, when I met him in Seattle, on the campus of Seattle and, and online and so on and so forth, he was a, he was a actively involved in trying to love his preborn neighbor. He was, he was doing campus evangelism, um, exposing abortion um, with a pro-life organization called Created Equal. They do good work in sort of exposing like the abortion images and that sort of thing. But as he was writing and wrestling with ideas and ideology and their application, um, just the, the paradigm of the pro-life movement and the organization that he was with and the paradigm of the abolitionist and the bills and legislation that we were trying to, to put forward began to clash. And when that happens for so many people, the pressure of their peers or the people paying them, the pro-life organization, usually kicks in and, you know, it's a kind of a trump card, but not for James. And so... Um, when he kind of converted to abolitionism, it sounds really bad when we say it that way, but when he, when he moved from pro-life to abolitionism, it really blessed the movement, it blessed our organization, in that he is such a not only talented writer, but also willing writer who works very hard. So a lot of the regularly published blog posts on the Free the States website is, is James seeing different things that are happening and saying, okay, here's the abolitionist perspective on this bill or that politician. And so he just works really, really hard writing all the time. He doesn't do anything else. He's really lazy in all other areas. <laughs> I'm just kidding. James, are you in here? Oh, no. He's really good at everything he does. But this, in particular, this pamphlet, which I said the other night is, you know, 10 years in the making. It's really been 10 years in the wanting but we finally have a pamphlet that lays out the case for the tenets of abolitionism and the components of an abolition bill. So he's just done a lot of good work for us. Um, those of y'all who uh, help him to do that um, by funding Free the States and stuff, you are doing a good thing keeping this young man at his keyboard warrioring. So welcome James, he's gonna come speak to us on moving from pro-life to abolition. So I've got a, uh, a, real, a real nerdy topic today, something uh, you guys may have heard Russell or others mention, you know, Kuhnian revolutions, that sort of stuff. But uh, as, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a kind of a presentation um, given on this, on this subject, a full presentation given. And so when we were talking last, last November about what we wanted talked about, this was something that uh, I immediately jumped at because I think it's, I think it's important stuff. Um, and it's, it's kind of... Um, it's it's kind of it's kind of an, an in-house discussion. It's something that uh, there are um, different perspectives on this, and I want to give our perspective on this. Um, and so, without further ado, let's get into it. Um, we have a pro-life versus pro-choice thing going on. That's been going on for a long time, right? And there's not a lot of, or uh, I guess I mean, probably accurate to say, there's, there's really no progress being made um, because the pro-life perspective is not let's like shift the entire paradigm underneath this this culture it's you know let's try to appeal to the moderates right let's try to let's try to to test our talking points according to a poll and see what we think is going to is going to pull well with independence or something they're not trying to actually get people to understand abortion really is murder and they don't talk as if they're even trying to do that they just talk about how extreme the democrats are and how how moderate pro lifers are and that's and, and, and that's what they're trying to do, trying to appeal to people where they are. But we're not going to abolish abortion trying to appeal to people where they are. We've got to shift something. Something's got to change. Um, and so we kind of bring a different, abolitionists bring a different perspective to this thing. Um, and so we are trying to, to shift a paradigm. And so let's talk first, I'll talk, uh, I guess, specifics about the pro-life paradigm, the abolition paradigm in a little bit here. But let's talk about just the basics. What is a paradigm? 
So kind of the expert on this subject is a guy by the name of Thomas Kuhn. He wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in the book, he's talking mostly about science. And so I've kind of translated his terms from scientific terms kind of into more kind of a political, social, theological terms. So a paradigm is a universally recognized or prevailing system of theories, facts, assumptions, and approaches which serve as a map for progress and problem solving within a certain field. So it could be science, it could be politics, it could be whatever, but it's, it's, it's the map of foundational assumptions um, that affect how you approach problems um, in whatever you are trying to do. So an example of this is geocentrism and heliocentrism. So for a long time, from about Ptolemy in the, in the second century till about the 1500s, they believed the Earth was in the middle. And so all of their, um, all, all of the work that they would do in astronomy was based on that assumption that turned out to be a false assumption. And what happens when you've got a false assumption at the beginning is you get really wacky, weird stuff. Like if you look at like how like Mars and some of the ones on the edge are moving in the, in the geocentrism one, it's just all over the place, right? This, this, this wacky stuff. And it's because their foundational assumption was wrong. They thought the earth was in the middle and it led to all these awful, awful mistakes. And then you get Copernicus and some other people who are saying, well, if we actually change our foundational assumption here, we actually see that this all works pretty uniformly and looks, it, looks, it looks pretty natural and good. Maybe our foundational assumption is wrong. And so that's kind of what we need. We, we've got to understand the foundational assumptions of the pro-life movement are wrong. Um, so, and that's, that's, what, that's what leads to a lot of, a lot of the errors. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the phases of a paradigm shift. So we've got, we've got the normal phase. So we've got a paradigm that is entrenched and established. It is the foundation for all work, for all problem solving, for all progress that is done in a field. Now, there are issues that come up in every paradigm. But in the normal phase, issues that come up are kind of swept under the rug. They're not seen as a problem to the paradigm. So like say if, if like abortion rates are going up in Oklahoma as they are, as they have in 2017 and 2018, uh, the pro-lifers in, in a normal phase, they'll be able to just sweep that under the rug and not have to deal with it because the crisis phase hasn't occurred yet. It's a normal phase and so there aren't, people aren't doubting the paradigm quite yet. It's still the normal phase. And so, there, there, there isn't critique, and if there is critique, the normal phase cannot continue. And so once there is a serious, once there's holes being poked and really pressed, then we get to the next stage, which is the crisis phase. So the crisis phase is, again, new information has been discovered, like say abortion rates are going up when, when the, these regulations should be making abortion going down, or other, other things are happening, which makes people think, well, are our foundational assumptions right? And there's a group of people who will really press this issue and say, is it, are our foundational assumptions right? And you'll get competing theories about, about where, where to go, you'll get an expression of explicit discontent, and you'll get a recourse, and this is a quote from, uh, from Kuhn, recourse to philosophy and debate over fundamentals. So our fundamental assumptions are now being challenged. <clears throat> What the advocates of the entrenched paradigm will do is that they'll try to make it fit within the current paradigm. So they'll try to come up with some explanation for why abortion just went up in Oklahoma, even though three pro-life bills were passed last year, or something like that. They'll, they'll, try, to, they'll try to make it make sense. Um, now, they'll, they'll try to do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If they're not able to absorb the, the, uh, the errors into their own view and explain it within their own view, then we move on to the next stage, which is the revolution phase. Now this is when these, these, uh, these bits of information that don't fit within the paradigm are, have really been pressed and we get to a point where a new foundational assumption replaces the old foundational assumption. And once a critical mass of people embrace these new foundational assumptions, the paradigm has shifted, the old is supplanted with the new. What was previously fringe is now the new normal and the normal stage begins again. So, Notes on paradigms, the shift typically takes 20 to 30 years. Now, it, there's, there's some variance. It could, be, it could be, you know, 15, it could be 40, but typically it's 20 to 30. Human beings are sinful. We are prideful. And so uh, people, the, the shift doesn't really take place until the people who are entrenched in the present paradigm retire or, or pass away. And that's about 20, 30 years is how long it takes for kind of an entrenched system of people to be uh, supplanted by a younger generation um, of people. Now, an another note, the people who shift paradigms, Kuhn, Kuhn speaks a, lo a lot about this, the people um, who cause these paradigms to shift. Now, they're people who are not entrenched in the current paradigm. And they're also people who are typically young, creative, and eccentric. 
creative, eccentric. Apropos of nothing, here's a picture I took last night. <laughs> Straight croutons, no salad. All righty. <laughs> oh, also, Captain Crunch, no milk. That's another one, another good one. So let's get to the specifics. That's what a paradigm is, how a paradigm shifts. What is the paradigm that, we're, that is supplanted right now within American Christianity and really Christianity all over the world? So we've got this pro-life paradigm, right? Now this paradigm is secular. It's explicitly secular, right? A lot of you have seen, will have seen this. If you've seen um, the Tony Lowinger interview with, with, uh, with Jeff Durbin, he's like, is your organization a Christian organization? And he's saying, no, it's not a Christian organization. Uh, that's something I've experienced in uh, organizations that I've been with. No, we're not explicitly Christian. There's one organization that makes their volunteers sign a waiver saying, I will not bring up religion unless the other person I'm talking to brings it up first, right? Explicitly secular movement. Now, the result of that is that um, you know, Nate, Nate gave a great presentation on you know, Christ is king and he's Lord, and that's, and that's part of that's central to Christianity, when you've got a secular movement, you're not going to have that foundational assumption. Their foundational assumption is that SCOTUS is king. There's no law above SCOTUS. There's no evil, there's no unconstitutional usurpation SCOTUS can do that the pro-lifers would stand up to and defy. How do we know that? Because SCOTUS has already done just about the most evil thing that could possibly be imagined. They have forced child sacrifice on every state in the union. Right? There are very few things they could do more evil and unconstitutional than that, and the pro-lifers, pro-life leaders at least, and most of the pro-life followers will not stand up and defy them. Scotus is king. That's a, that's a foundational assumption within the pro-life paradigm. Now, because Scotus is king, all we can do is regulate abortion as much as the courts will allow. Now, there's a really important point here, as much as the courts will allow. In KCV Planned Parenthood, the courts established or they, they uh, I shouldn't say established, I should say opined that no law can be allowed, a federal law or state law can be allowed if it, if it is an undue burden on the right to an abortion, right? If it's an undue burden. And what that basically means is that anything that would prevent a woman from getting an abortion if she wants to is an undue burden. But the pro-lifers still pass all these regulations with the, with the hope that, um, that, that they'll do something, but any law that can be upheld by the courts can't be an undue burden. And so no laws that are a burden on the right to abortion will ever be upheld within KCV Planned Parenthood, but still they try. But still they try, and these laws don't do anything. Again, the foundation is secular, the foundation is SCOTUS is king, and because of that, they've got this foolish strategy of passing laws that don't do anything, because they won't stand up and defy the Supreme Court. Now, a point that is, it, it, this is a very nuanced point, it's a very important point. So. When we, when, we, when we criticize pro-lifers, criticize the pro-life movement, we're most, we're most applicably speaking against the pro-life leaders, right? They're the ones who make the calls, who write the bills, who lobby for the bills, all of that stuff. But it's not as if all of the followers of these groups are totally, are totally innocent in it, right? There was, there was a Pew poll a few years ago that found that 44% of the country is pro-life, 44%. And the same poll found that only 9% of the country wanted abortion to be illegal in all cases. Now, now what does that mean? That means about one in five professing pro-lifers wants abortion to be completely abolished. One in five, right? And so for those one in five, we need to try to reach them and show them, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're actually the ones who are, who, are, who are working for this. But for the four out of five, it's we need to change them. We need to show them that what they believe is evil. It doesn't matter if they call themselves pro-life, right? It doesn't, like Greg, Greg McCourtney, all these guys will call themselves pro-life, Greg Treat, Kim David. The thing is bad, and we've got to, we've got to be able to, to show people that. Um, another foundational assumption is this idea of, of, of worldly wisdom, of pragmatism. We've got to do what, as much as we can do, right? as Klusendorf says, limit the evil insofar as we are able. Right? But there, again, this kind of goes back to the, to the regulate abortion point. They don't end up doing anything. Like these laws that pass don't do anything because they can't do anything because the court has said that anything we uphold by it can't do anything, and if it does do anything, then we're not going to uphold it. And so the only option is defying the court, but they, they won't entertain it. They won't entertain the possibility. They'll call you a radical. They'll call you a secessionist. Even if you write in the bill, this bill is nothing, nothing in this bill shall be construed as an attempt to secede, right? They, they, they won't entertain this possibility of actually standing up to the courts. 
and it's, it's not worldly wise. It's, or it is worldly wise, but it's not actually wise. It's foolishness. It is really, really, really foolish. Now, their foil is the, is the pro-choicers, right? So you've got this battle between the pro-lifers and the pro-choicers, and that's, that's the foundational uh, conflict within the paradigm. Now, where do we need them to go? We need them to embrace an abolitionist paradigm. Now, this paradigm is not secular. We are Christians. We profess to be Christians. We profess to bring Christianity into conflict with the culture of death, into conflict with apathy, into conflict with compromise. We are Christians. And so accordingly, we do not unconditionally submit to SCOTUS. We unconditionally submit to Christ. There is no unconditional submission except to him. Now, even under Christ, you've got the Constitution, which we can also appeal to, right, which Roe was completely unconstitutional. And so we've got, we've got a, a, uh, a paradigm that has its, its, um, its, its uh, authorities in order, right? It's Christ is above the Constitution, is above SCOTUS, right? It's not SCOTUS is above Christ and Constitution. That's an absurd, it's crazy that that is, but that is the foundational assumption of their paradigm. SCOTUS is king. Forget what God's word says, forget what the Constitution says, SCOTUS is king. We reject this, Christ is king. We do not seek to regulate abortion, we seek to abolish it, Im <coughs> excuse me, we seek to abolish it immediately without compromise. Uh, Again, we are, we, are, we are wisdom in a way that is not worldly wise and actually foolish. We are, we are wise according to God's word. We are wise. Uh, and people will say, well, if you follow God's word, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have an effect because the culture isn't, isn't gonna go with you on God's word. Well, the culture needs to go with us on God's word. And that's how you shift a paradigm. You draw a line, you stick to it, you make them, you make them embrace a paradigm that's good and true and righteous. You don't, you don't compromise from it. Uh, our, this paradigm is a movement of the body of Christ. Uh, Dusty talked really awesomely about this and above some of other pieces of this paradigm. Um, and our foil, the people we're, we're against, again, it's pro-choicers, of course, and about four-fifths of the pro-lifers, right? So now the question, we know what a paradigm is, we know the stages of a paradigm shift, we know what the current paradigm and what our suggested paradigm is. Now, how do we get there? How do we get from this pro-life paradigm to the abolitionist paradigm? The first one is very, very important. And this is, this is the one that's uh, maybe a, a topic of discussion within the movement. And I am explaining what, what our position is. We think we, should, we need to draw a clear line between the pro-life movement and the abolitionist movement. Now, after you've done that, after you've drawn a clear line, you said, here's the pro-life movement, here's the abolitionist movement, you can educate people and you can agitate people. Those are the two ways of persuading people to cross the line from pro-life to abolition. <clears throat> so, he, so here's what we have. We've got pro-life ideas, pro-life bills, pro-life candidates. We've got abolition bills, abolition ideas, and abolitionist candidates, right? We need them to cross that line. But if we don't draw a stark line about what's what, People aren't going to know that where they are isn't good enough. People aren't going to know where we need them to move to. We need to have the stark line in order to, to get them to move, even, even to set ourselves up to be able to persuade, to be able to educate, to be able to agitate people to move where they need to. We've got to have the stark line so people know what's what. And that's how we will get something more like that. Now, as a tangible example, here is a mailer that was sent out this past election cycle by Senator Greg McCourtney. Now, he is a pro-lifer. Most of you uh, in the room, probably most of you even watching online, will know that this is the guy who has fought abolition tooth and nail for the last two years. Uh, probably along with Greg Treat and Kim David, probably, probably those three are the three people most responsible for child sacrifice occurring today and tomorrow and the next day. But here's the mailer that Greg McCourtney I'm not even sure if he sent us. I mean, this looks like it was actually National Right to Life who sent this out on behalf of Greg McCourtney uh, saying, well, look at this pro-life hero who you should vote for. Now, Greg McCourtney was being opposed by Carissa Robertson, who spoke at this conference last year, spoke at the rally last year. And a lot of you know her. But National Right to Life and Oklahomans for Life were saying, look at how pro-life Greg McCourtney is. Now, are we going to be able to out pro-life National Right to Life and Oklahomans for Life? Right? They, they, they've, they've had this thing for... 46, 47, 48 years, maybe even before Roe, right? They've, they've, they have a pro-life thing that they've been doing for a long time, and that word is associated with them. And it's going to be very, very difficult to, to convince people that they are not pro-life. It's what they've been for 50 years. 
And it's, they have the money to send out mailer after mailer after mailer after mailer like this. They've got the political connections to disseminate all these ideas that they're the, they're the pro-life ones. I don't think we're going to be able to out-pro-life them. But what we can do is we can shift the paradigm, shift the culture underneath them, get voters looking not for who's pro-life. Okay, you say you're pro-life. Are you going to actually abolish abortion? I don't care what you, what you say, what, what, what your moral opinion on abortion is. Are you going to abolish it? You've got to teach people not to look for pro-life. You've got to teach people to see stuff like this and ask the follow-up. Yeah, but I don't care. What, what is your stance on the abolition of abortion? Right? And so that's what we've got to get people to do. We're not going to be able to out-pro-life them. So once you have a clear line, you can educate. And this is, I would say this is the primary objective of, of Free the States at the moment is, is creating educational materials like the, like the pamphlet that we passed out um, and that will be on our store hopefully soon here when we have a store online um, and the Liberator podcast and things like that. We, we need to get these ideas out there, right? These ideas are really, really good and the pro-life ideas are really, really bad, right? It's, it's not all that difficult to, to get people to see that Christ is king and Scotus is not. If someone is a believing Christian, that's not a hard sell. Right? We've, we've got to get the ideas out there. We've got to show people how pro-lifeism is not in alignment with God's word, is not in alignment with the Constitution, and how pro-life bills, and I guess I should explain these a little bit. Um, so, I'll, so, so pro-life bills dehumanize pre-born children. And I talk about this in the pamphlet, but what I mean by that is they teach people certain things. So when I met with a, a state senator named Andrew Brenner from Ohio, back when I lived in Ohio, um, I, I met, or sorry, I didn't meet with him, I met with his aide. And I, I explained to her what an abolition bill is. I bring SB 13 and I bring the Texas abolition bill. And I say, here's what it looks like. And then I explain why we need one in Ohio. And at the end of the meeting, or at the end of my talk, she says to me, this is interesting and all, but it's Senator Brenner's personal religious conviction that life begins at a heartbeat. Now, where does someone learn something like that? Right? You don't learn that in God's Word. <laughs> you don't learn that from, from, from anything except a heartbeat bill. Right? Brenner had been a champion of the heartbeat bill for a long time, for about six years before it finally passed in Ohio. He was a pro-life stalwart for the heartbeat bill. And the result of that is that he came to believe the rhetoric that he was preaching, that life begins at a heartbeat. And that's, that's the effect of this pro-life legislation that dehumanizes those preborn children who are not protected by it. Now, another there's, there's three examples I always give on this topic. Another one is uh, when, when Russell was at, the, uh, at uh, Larry Burns's murder mill uh, in Norman, just about 30 minutes south of here, and a, a young woman who's walking in, Russell's calling out to her, and she says, it's okay, it's okay. My baby won't feel any pain. I'm pro-life, but my baby isn't going to feel any pain. All right, well, where does someone learn something like that? From the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which teaches that pain capability is what makes you worthy of being protected by law. Right? These, things, these things have effects. And then my other colleague, Sam Riley, was at, a, was at a campus in California doing outreach. And this young woman, young student, comes up to him and says, I see you guys are against abortion, but what about the case of rape? And he says to her, you know, why it's, you know, it's, it's still killing a human being. You know, human beings are made in the image of God. They're valuable. And even if a child's conceived in rape, it's wrong to murder that child for the crimes of the father. This woman just breaks down in tears. And she says, I was conceived in rape. Thank you for saying that. It makes me feel like I shouldn't be alive when people talk about these laws that allow murder in the case of rape, right? And so these, these laws with exceptions and these laws that say which children are, are young enough to be murdered dehumanize preborn children. And it's, it's, again, it's, it's not a hard sell. Um, and these pro-life bills uh, entrench judicial supremacy. So Frederick Douglass um, is, is the one who talked about how... Um, how the, the, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the tolerance of those who they oppress, right? The, uh, how, how power never concedes anything without a demand. And pro-life laws do not demand anything. They're, they're complete and total submission, right? I, 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 pick on, I pick on Joe Poyman of Texas Alliance for Life a lot, but he deserves it. So uh, it, it's so bad, right? He, he goes to the Austin Chronicle. And, and, and talking about the abolition bill in Texas. And he says, we could no sooner ignore SCOTUS than we could ignore the law of gravity, right? That's putting <laughs> SCOTUS on par with the laws of nature, right? Our submission to SCOTUS is like our submission to the laws of nature. 
I mean, it's, 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 it's not just like political disagreement, it's idolatry. It's putting the court above God. And that really is the posture of the pro-life movement, is unconditional submission. And these bills entrench that mentality. Because if we could abolish abortion in defiance of the Supreme Court, then we should. But if we can't, then let's just, whatever, let's just, let's just regulate it with whatever they'll let us regulate it with. And so every time they write one of these bills, it reaffirms this idea that we can't stand up to the courts. We've got to stop that. And then delays abolition. This is what my whole talk last year at this conference was all about. Um, William Lloyd Garrison wrote that, uh, that th these, these uh, substitutes for abolition, that, 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 the, that these pro-slavery and anti-slavery people would support in the place of abolition work as a substitute for abolition. So we saw this last week. We're at, we're at the hearing on Wednesday, and there are five bills passed out of the Health and Human Services Committee Pro-life bills passed on the same day they killed the bill to abolish abortion. That's got to be a record. I mean, I'll, I'll have to look and go confirm maybe, but I can't imagine there's ever been five pro-life bills passed out of one committee on the same day. Now, why did they do that? They did that because they just killed the bill to abolish abortion. So everyone's going to be really mad at them. So what do they have to do? They've got to pass a bunch of pro-life bills in its place. And that's what helps them get away with it. And so the key to abolishing abortion is not letting them get away with it, taking away the thing that allows them to get away with it, which is the pro-life bills. So these pro-life bills delay abolition. And so as, as on the other side of the, of the line there, abolitionist paradigm aligns with God's word, aligns with the Constitution, teaches the culture to value preborn children equally. The law is a teacher, right? People learn things from the law. And so if you write a law saying preborn children will be protected equally, that mentality is going to spread throughout that culture. People often say that, that culture is downstream from politics, and it's true, or so, um, excuse me, politics is downstream from culture, and that's true, but it also flows both ways. They're both downstream from each other. Politics affects culture, and culture affects politics. The law is a teacher, and so we've got to teach people the right things. We can't t keep teaching people that it's okay to murder babies as long as they don't feel pain as long as they don't have a detectable heartbeat. We've got to teach people to value preborn children equally. We've got to stand up to judicial supremacy and abolish abortion immediately. No more delays. Now, education is one way to persuade. Agitation is the other. Now, this is a bit more of a confrontational method. Um, there are exceptions to this rule, but I would say that generally we should try to educate before we agitate. If someone will hear you out, um, you, want to, you want to have that relationship be a, a productive one for as long as it can. Now, there comes a point where if they cut off communication or if they won't listen, where you have to agitate. Um, as, as an example of this, I was emailing a senator just recently. Um, should, I, should I use her name? Yeah, she, she, she just voted to keep abortion legal, so I'm going to use her name. <laughs> uh, her name is Julie Daniels. She is a senator from Bartlesville, and she was one of the seven pro-life Republicans who just last week voted to keep abortion legal in Oklahoma. Now, she went on the radio in, in Bartlesville uh, just a day or two after that happened, and she actually treated us fairly. She, she didn't straw man us. She didn't call us violent, you know, lunatics or whatever, like, you know, like Greg Treat and some of the others do, she actually treated us fairly. And so I reached out to her with an email, and I said, hey, I really appreciated, you know, that you didn't strawman us. We're very, used, we're very used to being treated poorly by the other senators in the media. And so, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I would love to, um, to have a dialogue with you if you're willing to meet or have a phone call or anything like that. Um, and so I was, I was very nice. Even though she had just tried to keep abortion legal, I was trying to educate. I wrote this long, really well thought out, very gracious thing, trying to educate. And I get a one sentence response. I get, thank you for this email, Julie. And that's it. So she's, she's not going to be educated, right? She's not gonna hear me out. She's not gonna meet with any of us. And so what's left? Agitation. I've been left with no other method to persuade. And so my response, it was still, uh, it was still thoughtful. It wasn't just you know me saying, ah, repent, sinner. You know, I was still thoughtful. But I said, okay, so you've you've left one option on the table. If you won't hear us out, if you won't meet with us, you've left us one option, right? Holocausts and their enablers have to be exposed, right? And so I'm 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 agitating. I'm I'm pricking her conscience more forcefully now. Now, there are exceptions to that rule. There, there may be cases where agitation is appropriate to come before education, um, but I always try to, I try to educate before moving to the more, to the more confrontational stage. Um, and if, if a clear line is drawn, and if we, if we educate well, and if we agitate hard and forcefully, um, we're, we're gonna see success, right? Because again, the ideas are too good, and the pro-life 
you know, Supreme Court idolatry and incrementalism is too bad, right? People who have the Spirit of God will respond to this stuff if we do our jobs well. But we've, we've got to have that clear line, right? Otherwise, they're not going to know that they need to move. They're not going to know they need to move from this pro-life paradigm to the abolitionist paradigm. So we've got to draw the line clearly, we've got to educate well, and we've got to agitate hard. I want to close by speaking real briefly about, I guess more about, what happened last week. Right? They, they killed the bill, right? and they probably thought, well, I, I know uh, with, with a, a good degree of certainty that what they were trying to do is they were trying to, to discourage us here at this conference, discourage those who will attend the rally tomorrow. Right? This bill, Joseph carried this bill for five years, and they never once gave it a hearing, and all of a sudden they hear it on the third day of the session. Right? It's, it's basically unheard of for something to be, to be heard in committee that early. Right? They were trying to get it out of the way early, before this conference, before the rally, to discourage us. Right? And so they, politicians think in very short, they, they, think, they think for the short term. And so in the short term, that is a, a discouraging thing. Right? But our objectives are never the short term. Our objectives is shifting this paradigm. Right now, I don't know if they understand that. I, you know, again, they only they only think in very short term. Um, they, they think only for the short term, and so they may not see that it's happening. But this paradigm is shifting underneath them. Right, this uh, this, this movement is growing exponentially. Right, we've got a very clear line here in Oklahoma, and bold and uh, humble and hardworking Christians are rallying to this cause. Right, because we've got a clear line, and we're educating well, and we're agitating hard. And so don't be discouraged. Right? They're trying to discourage. Don't be discouraged. Our, our, our goals are not short-term. Our goals are revolutionizing the culture. Right? We've got to change the pro-choicers, and we've got to change four-fifths of the pro-lifers. That's our goal, and we're doing that well, and we're going to keep doing it, and there's no vote that's going to stop us from doing that. Um, and the success that we're experiencing is, is tremendous. And seeing the, the church stepping up here in Oklahoma, right? Seeing Brett and Kelly and Dusty and Chris and Sam and Tim and Thomas Lowry, all these guys, right? The paradigm is shifting, right? They're, they're joining this thing. And so don't be discouraged. Keep fighting. Keep agitating. Keep educating. And we're going to see success. Thank you. I've been going through conference schedules. I bring one up here, I read off of it, and I take it somewhere and it disappears. But I believe I know who's speaking next. Let me tell you something. Is Brett Baggett in the room? He is, right? Where is he at? Oh my gosh. Wow, it's a bright light. Let me tell you, a lot of y'all probably are familiar with Brett because he's been on a war path for a lot of this stuff. Um, you've probably seen him teach. You've been to um, conferences like this that he's hosted in his own church. I'm not sure, but I think that was like the first sort of like a pastor of a church took it on himself to have an abolitionist conference in his church building for his fellowship and for anyone else who wanted to come. And he has been sort of one of the guys, for those of y'all who are outside of Oklahoma, you're probably just getting pretty jealous by about now, you're like, man, I can't get any of the pastors in my area to really pick this up. And honestly, neither could we. And it wasn't until the pastors themselves did it that they've picked it up and they've really been running it. But um, I could say all sorts of good things about all of them, um, different strengths and weaknesses. But the thing that I so appreciate about Brett and it's become kind of a, I don't know if I've ever told him this, maybe Josh or James or someone has, but he's kind of like an uh, inside joke or a running joke around the office, around our families. Anytime there's like something that's clear that the Word of God says, and like there's a little wavering on it, we always go, it's right there! God says it. It's right there in the text. Do it. 
And sometimes when we don't have the energy to do all that, we just go, Brett! Because <laughs> that, and, and you know, and sometimes you get on Facebook, which is funny, because I get on Facebook and I'm like looking at stuff, I'm like, ooh, that's radical, oh my gosh, oh, that's, you know, whoa, really pushing the line there, and, uh, which is a welcome thing. But um, sometimes you'll be scrolling around on Facebook and you'll come across a um, status or something from Brett, and you're like, wow, he said it, he said it. Culture's not going to like that because that is biblical. Wow. Oh, man, our culture's messed up. And then you just look in the comments, and he's like, I don't know why anyone's freaking out. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> and I'm like, Brett's being Brett on Facebook. So it's just something to supremely appreciate. And I think that I think that, that explains why it was. Um, I think Brett's been an abolitionist for quite some time and has been teaching these kinds of things in his church. Um, for longer than probably a lot of us even know, and it's because he's, and we did an episode of the Liberator podcast, you can go back and watch uh, him talk about this further, um, this biographical stuff, but it was kind of like whenever he first saw some kind of an abolitionist uh, drop card or pamphlet or something, and he just looked at it and he goes, yeah, that's biblical, and it just didn't, it didn't take him any any uh, any time, and it was because he didn't look at it and go, "Is this going to play well with my people? Am, am I going to move up in the world? Uh, am I going to lose fans and all this kind of stuff?" He just that, those things were not important to him, and he'll say, "Well, it's because I didn't have a great platform," but everyone has some kind of platform, and everyone everyone has something to lose, and this is a pastor of a church who has a greater platform than many others just saying, I'm not concerned about my platform. I'm concerned, is it biblical? Is it honoring to God? And so it was like, some people it takes years to become an abolitionist. Other people it takes a second. And I think that person that takes a second, it's because they're wholly submitted to the Word of God, reigning in their lives. And that's why when we were putting this together, we said, who do we want to speak on abolitionism as a command of Scripture? We said, Brett Baggett. So y'all welcome him. Come speak at us today. Well, hey, if you've got a Bible, if you would, please grab it and go to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 20. Verses 1 through 5 is what I want to immediately point your attention to. So I'm tasked with essentially asking, I like to ask and answer a question. And so basically it's abolition commanded in Scripture, that's what I'm tasked with. But I've rephrased it a little bit and I just want to ask this question and seek to answer it for you. And, and my hope is by the end of this you will say, not only is abolition biblical, it is the only option. That's what I hope God does in you. Not just saying, oh yeah, that's a biblical option. No, I hope you see that it is the only option. And so the question I want to simply ask is, is abortion abolition biblical? Is abortion abolition biblical? So let's define those two words. Abolish. To formerly or to formerly put formally put an end to a system. Not formerly, formally put an end to a system, a practice, or an institution. So it's a formal putting to an end of something. Abolish, as has been frequently said, is a better word to use than end. Because we're talking about something come to, coming to a formal end, a system, a practice. And when we say we're going to abolish abortion, we don't think that we can keep murderers from murdering. But we do think we can keep them from doing it under the cover of law. So that our laws do not support the murder of anyone. Abortion is the unjustified, premeditated killing of a preborn human being. Abortion is the unjustified, 
premeditated killing of a preborn human being. Or we, we could just say it is the murder of a preborn human being. So is abortion, abolition, biblical? Another way to ask the same question is like this. Should it be legal to murder children? Or should it be illegal to murder children? Or a nuance to that would be, should it be illegal to murder children? That's abolition. It's illegal to murder children. Or should we work to make it more difficult to murder children? That's the secular pro-life movement. Abolition says it should be illegal to murder children. The pro-life movement says we should make it really difficult or try to change people's minds so that they won't want to murder their children. So I put those before you, and I just want to say, let's ask God what he has to say concerning abortion abolition. And so I've got these nine, nine questions that I'm going to ask you. I'll ask the question, and then I'm going to point you to specific scriptures, and I hope you'll see that God has very clear answers on these questions. Okay, so the first question is, what does God say about child sacrifice? What does God say about child sacrifice? And that's why I want to draw your attention to Leviticus 21 through 5, because simply there are many passages in the scripture that are not explicitly talking about abortion or child sacrifice, but we use them and apply them biblically with a proper approach to the Bible and say, well, that means abortion is wrong. You shall not murder. Is that talking about abortion explicitly? Like, well, no, it's not just talking about murdering preborn human beings or children. It's talking about murdering any image bearer of God. But we apply that command and say, well, that therefore means it's wrong to murder a child, right? Proverbs 24, 11. Rescue those being carried off to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. The wise man who wrote Proverbs 24, was he thinking about child sacrifice? Probably not. But we apply that command and that principle and we apply it to abortion, as we should. But I think sometimes people can forget that God himself speaks explicitly about child sacrifice, not just about murder in general. The Lord does not only speak about the evil of murder, he speaks about the evil of child sacrifice, which in our day is called abortion. And he explicitly speaks about it in Leviticus 21 through 5. What does God say about child sacrifice? I'm going to have to rapid fire these. I preached this text yesterday at the worship gathering of the church that I'm one of the pastors of, and it took, 100, or it took an hour and 12 minutes to preach these five verses with these exact eight points. But I'm going to rapid fire them at you, and I want you to have your eyes in the text and see what I'm saying is really just a rephrasing and propositional form of what God clearly says and implies in Leviticus 21 through 5. Okay? So if you... If you don't have a printed copy of the Word of God, as you should, open your phone and read it with me. Leviticus 21 through 5. First thing, the Lord has much to say concerning child sacrifice, which in our day is called abortion. Look at, the, look at verse 1 and the first part of verse 2. The Lord, what? Spoke or spake, if you have a King James. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, then verse 2, say to the people of Israel. We got three words already. Saying, the Lord speaks about child sacrifice and tells his prophet Moses to speak to God's people concerning child sacrifice. The Lord has much to say about it. My question to you is, do you listen? Do you listen? I'd remind you of the principle that we find in Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us 
and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What that means is God doesn't reveal everything you want to know. He doesn't reveal everything he could. He only reveals what you and I must know in order to love him and glorify him. If he has not revealed it, you don't need to spend your time delving into the deeps and trying to figure out the secret things of God. Moses says the secret things of God's secret counsel, they belong to him. But whatever he's revealed in the written word belongs to us and he's revealed it so that we may love him and obey him. So you are not allowed to avoid any part of the scripture. If it's in the scripture, that's everything God wants you to know. You also don't need to go beyond the scripture because the Lord has revealed everything you need to know in the scriptures. The Lord has much to say concerning child sacrifice, which in our day is called abortion. Second thing, child sacrifice is particularly evil because it is the slaughtering of a blessing the Lord has given. Child sacrifice is particularly evil because it is the slaughtering of a blessing the Lord has given. Second part of verse 2, look at it. Any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, so not only the covenant people of God, anybody from anywhere who happens to be there. This covers everybody. Any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who gives, that means offers, it's a Hebrew word, Nathan, where the prophet gets his name, it means a formal offering of something. Someone who gives his what? What's the word in the text? Seed is the best translation. Children in the English Standard Version, some of them render it offspring. It literally means your seed. It's the seed that God has blessed you with. God has blessed someone, he's opened the womb of a woman and caused pregnancy to happen. Fertilization happens, and that is the seed of that man. That's the blessing that the Lord has given him. And this is why it's particularly evil. Anyone who gives any of his seed or children or offspring to Molech shall surely be put to death. Do not miss the point of why it's particularly evil in Leviticus 20 is because a blessing that the Lord has given you, you're slaughtering it. All throughout the scriptures, it is without question that the Lord God closes and opens wombs. If you need to be reminded of this, just go read through the book of Genesis. Read about Samson's mother as well. Read all throughout the scriptures that God is sovereign over the opening and the closing of the womb. That means if you can get pregnant, it's because God decided to give you a gift. And the reason child sacrifice is evil is because you're taking a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward, and you're killing it. That's what Psalm 127.3 says. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Any children in here, look in my eyes. Children, boys and girls, look at me. You are a gift. God gave you to your mom and dad as a reward. You are a blessing. You are a gift. And how foolish are any of us who take a gift that God has given and we kill it. That's why child sacrifice is particularly evil. Third thing. Child sacrifice invokes both the physical and spiritual wrath of God. It invokes both the physical wrath of God as the governing authorities bear the sword and put to death evildoers. In Romans 13, God says the governing authorities who bear that sword, they don't bear it in vain, and they are God's avenger. 
God inflicts his physical wrath on wrongdoers through governing authorities. And that's what he says in this passage. But he also promises his, what I'll call, spiritual wrath, or you could say eternal wrath, or cosmic wrath. Not only the wrath of his servant bearing the sword and putting to death murderers, but also God himself setting his face against those who offer up their children. Look at it with me. Look at the second part of verse 2 and into the beginning of verse 3 in Leviticus 20. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. There's the physical wrath of God. It's execution. It's the first time, by the way, stoning is mentioned in your Bible. The first time stoning as a formal execution of an evildoer is mentioned is concerning throwing rocks at someone's head till they die because they killed their seed. You think child sacrifice isn't a big deal to God? Both the physical and spiritual wrath of God. Stone him with stones, first part of verse 3. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people. This is the cosmic wrath of God. In Ezekiel, the prophet says, the Lord sets his face against evildoers, and the Lord says, if you by chance escape the fire, I will burn you with fire. What does he mean? He's saying, if you escape the physical wrath executed by my ministers on this earth, you will not escape my wrath. That's what it means that God has set his face against someone and cut him off from among his people. Child sacrifice invokes both the physical and spiritual wrath of God. Fourth, child sacrifice is an attack on the worship of God and the glory of God. Leviticus 20, the second part of verse 3. To make, he says, to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. Why is God's name profaned when we offer up our children to a demon God? Because children are one of the chief blessings that the Lord gives us in this life. He opens the womb, he closes the womb. And when he's opened the womb to give a particular gift to someone and they kill the gift, his name is profaned. And when we sacrifice our children because we're really just in an act of idolatry, offering up our children for our own benefit, God's name is profaned, his sanctuary is made unclean. Child sacrifice is an attack on the worship of God and the glory of God. Fifth. The Lord has something to say to you who close your eyes or remain idle concerning child sacrifice happening in your land. So far it's been, don't you dare slaughter your children. And notice, the the promise, the cosmic wrath of God is promised on those who sacrifice their children. I will set my face against that man. Cut him off. Now he transitions and says, oh yeah, and you who would never consider offering up one of your children, he promises the same wrath to you if you remain indifferent towards those in your land who are slaughtering their children. Look at this, look at the first part of verse 4. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man, when he gives one of his children to Molech, and do not put him to death, stop there, just stop and realize the Lord is now pointing at every single one of us. Not only those who might potentially or have slaughtered one of our children that God gave us, but he's pointing at every single person, even those who would never even consider it. Because we all have a duty before God when it comes to child sacrifice. Sixth, closed eyes or idleness concerning child sacrifice invokes God's wrath upon you and your family. You're going to have to work that out. Some of you 
You don't like that kind of language in the scripture that says, I'm going to inflict my wrath on this man and his family. You should go, no, 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 that, that's not true. Let me read it. Read it with me. I will set my face against that man and against his clan or family and will cut them off from among their people. Who? Those who closed their eyes, remained indifferent or idle or ignored child sacrifice happening among them. Do you see that the same wrath is promised to those who kill their children and those who remain indifferent towards children being killed? Same exact language. The only thing not promised to you if you remain indifferent is that a governing authority should cut your head off. Like, well, you don't deserve that in our civil government, but you deserve and I deserve the cosmic wrath of God for remaining indifferent. I was in ministry, public ministry, to where I'm preaching in the gathering of a local church week in, week out, sometimes multiple times. I was in the full-time vocational ministry for eight years before I even preached a sermon on abortion. For eight years, I was blood guilty because my eyes were closed. Though I was an abolitionist, I think from like 2011 or 12, theoretically, I started seeing this abolish human abortion stuff and I thought these guys were just super pro-life and being biblical. Like, that's it. They're right. This is great. I, didn't, I talked to people individually about it a little bit. I didn't start going to the abortion mills until the first time I ever went. It's because a pastor friend said, I'm trying to get a bunch of pastors here. I was like, all right, I'll come. That was October of 2020. It's pathetic. First time I started going every single week was the first week in December of 2020. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of indifference. I'm guilty of closing my eyes. I'm especially guilty because for years now, I've known the truth. And I haven't acted. I have the same blood guilt on me that someone who sacrifices their children has on them. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Who was cut off from the land of the living so that I could be brought in. My only hope is looking to Christ in faith. But see here that closed eyes or idleness concerning child sacrifice invokes God's wrath upon you and your family. Run from apathy. Lastly, seventh in this passage... Child sacrifice is principally an act of spiritual idolatry. Child sacrifice is principally an act of spiritual idolatry. Look at the last part of verse 5 in Leviticus 20. Him and all who follow him in, somebody say it loud, whoring after Molech. Adults, you look at me. I'm not using synonyms, and I'm not going to explain that word right now. That word is there intentionally, and it means what you think it means. There are children in this room, and for me to delve deeper and deeper into that, I don't think is appropriate, because you know what it means to whore. And that is the language the Lord uses, notice the context, about you when you are indifferent towards child sacrifice. You're participating in the whoring after a demon god. It's principally an act of spiritual idolatry. I mean, in in this context, when they offered up their children to Molech, who was one of the gods or the god of the Ammonites, and the Phoenicians also worshipped him, they did the same thing people do today when they go to abortuaries. They kill their children so that their life is better than they thought it would be if they hadn't. That's what Molech said. You offer your children up to me, I'll give you what you need. And so people do it now. They offer their children up to death because they don't want another one. We see many people pull up to the murder mills, and they got car seats. They got multiple kids in their back seat. 
But it's an act of spiritual idolatry because these false demon gods that are behind this whole system are saying, you offer your children up to me and I will give you your heart's desire. It's spiritual idolatry. The Lord has much to say concerning child sacrifice, which in our day is called abortion. He speaks clearly concerning the evil, both of those who sacrifice their children and of those who remain indifferent while children are sacrificed in their land, promising his wrath on both. That's what God has to say about child sacrifice. Now, as we consider abolition in general, that's just, that was point one. That's the foundation. You have to understand that the Lord speaks clearly on this issue. And now let me just ask questions like a catechism. I'll ask a question and then God will answer it. And I hope you will see the pro-life movement is not an option for a Christian. The only option is abolition. What does God say about the approval of murder? What does God say about the approval of murder? At the beginning of 2019... There were some Oklahoma Baptist leaders, and I'm I'm a part of the Oklahoma Baptists. But some of the leaders released a letter saying they don't support Senate Bill 13, which would have made it illegal to kill children. At that same time, I was preaching through the book of Romans on the Lord's Day when the church I pastor gets together for worship. And I had just preached Romans 1. And I remember something that stood out to me, and I just couldn't avoid, is that in Paul's laundry list of the function of idolaters, he mentions murder. And then in verse 32 of Romans 1, he says, summarizing, he said, idolaters not only do these things, but they give approval to those who do. Idolaters are full of murder, and many other things, but at least murder. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I, I say Romans, the end of Romans 1, 29 and 32 as much as I possibly can to every person I meet. Because I cannot avoid that implication. And that is exactly what pro-life incremental bills do. They say, we're going to make it more difficult to murder a child even restrict it to four weeks before, or you have to jump through these hoops before, but in effect, all they say is, if you do this, this, and this, or by this time, we're happy with the fact that you slaughter your children. We give you a thumbs up, because there's no criminal penalty if you do it. That's the approval of murder. What does God say about it? He says, that's what idolaters do. Pro-life incremental bills are idolatrous by nature. What does God say about doing evil that good may come? Pro-life bills and the strategy is typically like, well, we can't totally outlaw it, but we want to make it more difficult, and so we write these same kind of bills. And it's like, I know we're allowing this evil, but look at how many babies we're going to save. That is literally doing evil So that good may come. We're going to do this evil, allow this child sacrifice, because we think it's going to save some babies, which in reality it does not. But what does God say principally about doing evil that good may come? Romans 3 8. Why not do good or do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. And he says, their condemnation is just. Do you see the point? His argument is, well, if that's true, why not just do evil that good may come? Because God's sovereign. He'll work it for good. He doesn't even rebuke it. He just says, the people that slanderously charge me and the other apostles for saying such nonsense are condemned. He doesn't even say, they're ridiculous. As some slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. It's unthinkable for the Apostle Paul to say, we could do evil that good may come. That's what God says about that question. What does God say about governing authorities? 
who show partiality to the wicked. What does that mean to show partiality to the wicked? It means our governing authorities, our civil magistrates, will allow a specific group or type of person to do something evil with impunity. They can do these wicked acts, and there are no consequences. That's partiality. Right now in all of our states, women are shown unjust partiality because they're told you can murder your child and nothing will happen to you. So what does God say about showing partiality to the wicked? Psalm 82, 2 through 4. The Lord speaking to governing authorities. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Which means, just pause and think about that. Pause and meditate. How long will you judge unjustly, governing authorities, and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's what God says about it. How long are you going to do that? You must give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Do not show partiality to the wicked. What does God say about those who keep writing oppression, making the fatherless their prey? Any kind of bill that has to do with abortion that does not make it or treat it as murder under the same codes as homicide is someone who writes oppression. It's an iniquitous decree. What does God have to say about iniquitous decrees? Isaiah 10, 1 and 2. You guys know what the word woe means? W-O-E. It's a curse. A cursing calling on this person. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right. Those who do this, who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression, he says that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. Those who decree iniquitous decrees and allow people to sacrifice their children under the cover of law by jumping through specific hoops, whatever the hoops may be, they make the fatherless their prey. And God says, they're cursed. Woe to you. What does God say about the duties of governing authorities in general? He says they bear the sword. And they don't bear it in vain. This is established in the Noahic Covenant in Genesis 9. Here's the the message translation. You kill somebody, we're going to kill you. That's the long and the short of it. Because God made man in his own image, you murder someone, death penalty. That's the job of governing authorities. Romans 13, 3 through 4 They don't bear the sword in vain. Governing authorities are God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. That's the duty of governing authorities. What does God say about your duty concerning those who are being carried off to death? One of my goals is that everyone would have Proverbs 24.11 memorized and receive it as your marching orders and just think that all the time. This is my command. The wise man does not say, pray for those being carried off to death. It's an imperative. It's a verb. It's action. Rescue those being carried off to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. That is your duty
What does God say about your worship when you are indifferent toward the innocent being slain? This is Isaiah 1, 14 through 18. Just look at me. I'll summarize this for you because I think time is away. What does God say about your worship? I don't mean our worship. I mean each one of you individually. Each one of you. What does God say about your worship when you are indifferent towards child sacrifice? He said, I hate it. You lift up your hands to pray. God says, I close my eyes. You make prayers. I close my ears. He says, I'm weary. I'm tired of bearing your worship when your hands are full of blood. If you are indifferent towards child sacrifice, God hates your worship and says, wash yourselves, which is the language of repentance. Don't make peace with child sacrifice. But because Christ was slain for us, wash yourselves in the blood of the Lamb. In Christ there is redemption. Forgiveness according to the riches of His grace. So look to Christ. And in conclusion, I would just ask you to think about this question. And I hope you see abolition calling for the immediate Abolition of abortion without exception or compromise. It's not only biblical in general. It's the only biblical approach to the abortion holocaust. But I just ask you for your personal application. How are you most like Christ? How can you be most like your Savior King who bled for you and now rules you? How can you be most like the God-man? 2 Timothy 1, Paul writes, Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So in, in a way that we mirror Christ's infinite work in abolishing death, for all of his people, for all who will have faith in Jesus, in your small way, be like your bleeding king and go work to abolish child sacrifice in his name. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you've spoken clearly in your word. We ask you to help us. Help us understand that abolition is the only approach. If we're taking our cues and we're learning from you and your written word, help us to just have confidence and boldness knowing this is what you say. This is how you tell us we must respond to these atrocities. We ask you to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We thank you for Christ Jesus being cut off for us like we deserve so that we could be counted righteous as Christ deserves. I ask you to save sinners, cause them to be born again even now, and trust in Christ alone, and stand in him gloriously complete. Sanctify your saints. Make us hate our sin more. Make us hate our apathy. Help us to love Jesus more and go and mirror him to the culture as we rescue those being carried off to death like he has done for us. Be glorified it's in Jesus' name we ask all this. If you agree with me, say amen. 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 Grace and peace to you. Brother Brett, as uh, someone who's been doing this for a very, very, very long time, um, it is so incredibly encouraging to hear someone uh, like Brett, a pastor who's as faithful with the scriptures as he is, making a confession like that about how 
he, he wasn't obedient in, in such profound ways until like October. And uh, like it just gives me the chills to see like we're all trying to repent and obey more and more with the next step that Christ puts in front of us. Like how do we actually follow him? This work that we're doing has always been about revival. Um, I've been an abolitionist uh, since the start of the Abolitionist Society of, the, of Norman, way back in the beginning. And um, the heart has always been, what is biblical? How do we follow God? How do we obey him and listen to his voice and not fear man, not, not care what anyone else can do to me? But how do, we, how do we listen closely to what his word says? And uh, there's so much temptation to faithlessness. There's so much temptation to closing our mouths. Um, and that's not by accident. That is a work that Satan is doing to deceive and to lie. Even saying things like, the people of God can't rise up and actually do anything about this. I mean, it's too big for us. The world system, you know, the government is just, it's more than we can handle. Or wh whatever aspect of it. But it's by faith that, like, we trust that through Christ we are more than conquerors. That the world system, that the, Satan cannot stand against us when we bear his word. And so, while I don't know how it all works out in the end... I can stake my claim on the fact that through the power of God, we have seen time and time throughout church history, the church overcome wickedness in the land. And that he promises that if we trust him and we follow him, he will, at least in some measure, heal us through that repentance. Now, whether it's to the scale that it heals our entire land or not, I don't know. But we know it will bring about revival in those who will listen. So this is a spiritual battle that we've always been fighting. It's never been about the politics. It's about revival. It's about the paradigm change shift. It's about how do you actually make the people of God wake up to what's happening and wake up to their role in what's happening. And so I'm going to play a song. I have been so encouraged this year hearing uh, specifically Brett preach about Moloch and child sacrifice and and. and on texts that are very hard for a lot of pastors to go to, um, to preach with the conviction that he does. And uh, so, so ever since I saw a talk of his back in October, I knew I was going to have to play this song again. <laughs> but this is a taunt song to Moloch. It's a bit dark, but it has a very good ending. Um, and it's, it's, trying, it's an attempt to describe the spiritual battle that we're in, how part of the work that we are doing we're seeking to overcome the works of the devil. First John says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And we're told in Romans 16 that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the people of God, the church's feet. And so it's our role and responsibility to, to make war against these demons. So this song is, uh, this song is called City of Blood. dreadful Moloch cloaked in darkness lurking 
underneath the skin you hide ravenous devouring the babes of selfish hurting fed now right before our eyes down the street in an office you creep up into her uterus and are feasting on her child in coldest blood altar for your feeding this woman's womb is bleeding as she tries to atone for guilt and shame but she cries for she feels her condemnation and she knows the great weight of law against her hope is gone for there's none she knows to rest in so she offers you her sacrifice she gives you now her offspring's life oh through the ages with your leader prince of darkness the adversary serpent full of lies yet you think he speaks now truly there's hope to conquer fully though you see so clearly how your game is up Set the holy against created. Summon death and sin through lies perverse. You conspire such evil to bring disaster upon every single man of earth. Yet you stand defeated, you've been shamed, you've been beaten through your evil plot. The king were greatest good, son of God, the redemptive fled and died, was rejected, nailed our payments to his cross of wood. So we were, yes we were, we will triumph over you, triumph over you, we will save the children, though our lives be taken, we will free the women bound in darkest lies. So we were, yes we were, we will triumph over you, triumph over you, yes we were, we will were, we will triumph over you, triumph over you. Light is coming, Christ has conquered, overcoming, more loathsome wood. Light is coming, Christ has conquered, overcoming, more loathsome wood. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our witness, we will crush you and beat you into the night. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our witness, we will 
crush you and beat you into the night. Oh. town with blood build a city on iniquities he will be weary without a single stone to show when the earth is filled with knowledge of the king woe to him Build a town with blood, build a city on iniquities. He will be weary without a single stone to show when the earth is filled with knowledge of the King. Filled with knowledge of the King. And Lord, we know that you are with us in this fight, God. We know that we don't go out of our own accord. But we have to trust in your power. We have to trust in the strength that you provide. And so, God, while we face what seem like insurmountable obstacles in a world that slays its children as a solution to their guilt, we cling to the cross and we preach the cross. Christ crucified is our redemption and our hope and our conquest. So, Lord, we pray that everyone who stands against you to build a city full of blood will be put to shame. Whether that be Greg McCourtney or Greg Treat or whoever that is up at the Capitol, but mo fundamentally, God, Moloch and Satan, the demons and the devil that are at war to lie, to cheat, to steal, to, to destroy everything that you are doing in this world, God. Put them to shame. Put them to open shame by your blood shed on the cross. Applied to our culture through the, the preached word by your people. Please, God, bring healing to our land. Please, God, let your word preach. Let your gospel proclaimed as the solution to the guilt problem, as the solution to the distance that people have from you and, and the waywardness. May it bring healing. May it do what the world says is impossible and lead a culture that is full of women who have participated, women and men who have participated in murdering their children to repentance and to admission that it's murder. Your gospel is the only power that can do this, Lord. Be with us and do this through us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Gore. I'm the one of the pastors of the First Baptist Church of Beggs, Oklahoma. Uh, and Russell asked me to introduce the next speaker uh, because he said if I get up here and do it, uh, maybe it won't take 20 minutes as he just sort of rambles uh, through anecdote after anecdote. And I said, uh, well, Russell, you don't know me very well. Uh, but, uh, and it was funny as I, I, I get to introduce Joseph Silk as he's going to come up in just a second. I was uh, talking to Joseph over there and he was like, uh, 
man, so Brett's finishing, right, laying out the word for us. He goes, why do I have to follow that? Like, <laughs> and what was funny is then right after that, uh, the Lord's like, all right, then I'm going to play a taunt song to Molech. <laughs> then you're going to follow that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just to tell you a little bit about Joseph, if you don't know him, uh, I met Joseph, uh, golly, it feels like forever ago now, um, just at the Capitol working for abolition. That's where I met uh, Russell, Free the States guys. Uh, and and I, I saw a man... Uh, who was pouring out everything in pursuit of this cause. I saw a man who was willing to uh, sacrifice political capital, anything that he needed to, uh, whose everyday life was made harder by what he was doing. And then I saw that man leave the state capitol, and I went, well, rats, because I'd been to the other state senators and House representatives, and there was no one like him. But the good thing is, the Lord was not done uh, with Joseph and his work to try and end abortion and to teach churches uh, how to end abortion uh, as well, how to be active in the legislature. And so it was actually funny. I think Joseph had said, it, you know, he'd sort of poured his life out, was going to just uh, go back to, to working a normal private sort of construction job. And, you know, he'd done, he'd done what he'd been called to do. And he actually heard a sermon from Brett, uh, and he heard it. He gets in the car with his wife, Kimberly, and Kimberly's sitting in the seat, and she just looks at him and says, did you hear what Brett said? Uh, and he was like, yes, uh, I did. Uh, and so I re- realized the, the Lord has blessed him with knowing some things that we don't know, which is how things operate in the legislature, how it operates at the Capitol, uh, and has also shown him the great power that you have in your voice. Uh, people at the Capitol and elsewhere will try and make you feel as if we are sort of these plebes, Uh, And they are our graders. Uh, But Joseph's going to today do something uh, I think is going to be very helpful. He's going to show you how you can engage your legislature. And this is something that he's going to do on a consistent basis with this group, Liberty Rising. Uh, I'm one of the board members who's going to keep an eye on him uh, and make sure he does does what's right. Uh, But this is going to be, I think, a very uh, uh, helpful introduction to the legislative process for you guys uh, and so, Joseph, come on up here. Uh, he, he, do you have your own taunt song to Molech? No. You, no, no, all right. He's just going to give you some really sage and wise advice. So, ladies and gentlemen, Joseph. All right, so I told my wife we were, we were looking forward to not travel. Well, I live four hours from the Capitol, and uh, we spent the last six years spending four months out of the year up here. And I told her, I was like, man, it's going to be so nice to not be up in Oklahoma City four hours from the Capitol. And then here we are again. And so we're continuing on. Uh, but I think most of you probably know me. I'm Joseph Silk. I did spend six years uh, with the, in the Oklahoma State Senate. Um, most of that time was engaged in, in abolition uh, type work. My wife Kimberly's here somewhere with our, we've got eight kiddos, number nine's on the way. Um, so I'm done, I'm done with the same state senate, and now we have moved into this, which is Liberty Rising Institute, which is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on what we, what we do. I'm not going to spend my time pitching abolition to you or explaining abolition to you. Um, I'm also not going to try to convince you that you have a duty to engage politically, because you do. And I think you've heard that pretty well today. So I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an inside perspective on how you can, some practical steps on what you need to do to effectively engage your legislature to actually end abortion, because we do indeed have a duty to stand up. Reality is Oklahoma is one of the most conservative states in the union, and we kill 15 to 20 children every day. And we have for a long, long time. So the question is, have we done enough? Have we as Christians, as the body of Christ, done enough to stop it? Have we personally done enough to stop it? The answer is no. And we have to realize that. We haven't done enough to stop it. The church has not been operating properly. We as individuals have not been operating strategically enough, and we haven't done enough because abortion is still going on. 
So on an important, on an issue like this, when it comes to actually attacking this issue, um, we, we have to be very wise, we have to be intentional, we have to be deliberate, and we have to have a strategy on what we can do. So just sending emails, showing up to a rally once a year, um, maybe you know, going holding up signs a couple of weekends a month, that's not enough. That's not gonna do it. You're just gonna be spinning your wheels. And you never, we're never going to get to the end game, and that's not good enough for me, and I'm pretty sure it's not good enough for you guys as, uh, either. It's kind of like this. I mean, on a, on a much lesser thing, say you were going to start a business. Are you just going to throw up a sign and put some stuff on the shelves? No. No, you're going to find out who your audience is, who you're targeting. You're going to do some market research. You're going to have a strategy, and that's what we have got to have here to avoid, again, to avoid just spinning our wheels and showing up once a year, because that's not, that's not going to do it. So why is it so important to be politically involved? Politically involved, I know a lot of you are out of state. This is going to apply to you just like it applies to everybody who is from Oklahoma. Why do we need to be involved politically at the state level? And the answer to that is because our state legislature currently is the best means to end abortion. That's the reality of it. It is the state legislature, and there's other things we need to do with city councils and stuff like that, but the state legislature is our best target that we can force them to actually end abortion. And a lot of people, you know, wonder why you know, people getting involved with abolition, why are we still, you know, why haven't, why haven't they ended abortion yet? We're voting for all these pro-life candidates, why haven't they done it yet? And the, the correct answer is because we've allowed them not to. We just got to take that. We haven't made them into abortion. And that's what we're here to talk about. So we're going we're gonna to talk about four issues here. Uh, and I'll try to, I think I'm going to be able to get us back on, on schedule. That's my goal, at least. We're going to talk about four points, four things that you can do to influence your legislature. These are very simple, but they need to be used as a checklist. And sometime tonight, go to the table. There's copies of them up. Take as many as you want. Use them as a checklist. These are steps that have got to be taken. Then at the end, we may do a Q&A, and I'm also going to address some fallacies that uh, when you're engaging your legislator, uh, some of the things are going to stay. Now, I'll be, I'll be fairly blunt at times when it, when it comes to how I speak about legislators. Um, so I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't think anybody here is going to be offended anyway. Um, but there's a lot of passionate people here, and you know a lot of passionate people who couldn't be here. But the, the real question is, what do we do? What do we do? And that's what people want to know. And I've talked to a lot of churches and a lot of people. They need something to do. And here is the four points that, from me, being in, in office, dealing with these guys for six years, this is what we need to do. Number one... And you can write these down. You can also go over there and pick this up later. Except the legislature is bad. They are bad. We have to stop being their fanboys. There's, there's something in our psyche that wants us to kind of root for our guys. It almost sounds unpatri or feels unpatriotic to be hating on the legislature all the time. Too bad. Get over it. They're bad. That's all there is to it. It is a bad organization operating in a very unbiblical manner. I served in the state senate for six years, like I said. Five of those years, I carried abolition bills, and every single year for five years, they wouldn't give an abolition bill, a bill that would actually end abortion. They wouldn't give it a hearing. They wouldn't even discuss it. When I wanted to have meetings with them, they wouldn't really want to talk about it. So, bad organization. Then, once I did force a vote, and a lot of you remember this, in 2020, Four, only four out of 48 Oklahoma State Senators voted in favor of it. More recently, with Senate Bill 495, on February 3rd of this year, it went through the Health and Human Services Committee, and they voted it down unanimously, zero to ten. These are bad people. That's all there is to it. We have to stop pretending like they're the good old boy that we see at the hardware store on the weekends when he's not in session. We have to take the gravity of what we are allowing our state government to get, a buy, get by with. That's all there is to it. And, and even, even a lot of us here, you know, well, you know, I know my guy and he's real cool and our governors. No, they're not. They're not at all. They're not doing anything to stop 20 babies a day 
from dying within our borders. So, I know that's kind of a, that's kind of a no-brainer, but ask yourself, has your, in, you, has your legislator, doesn't matter what state you're from, or has he, done, has he lifted a finger to actually end abortion? No. If he hasn't, he doesn't need to be in office anymore. So, number one, admit or accept that the legislature is bad. It's not unpatriotic. It's not, you know, ugly to, to think that. We've got to accept that. Because most of these officials did campaign on being pro-life, so they actually, they lied to you. So the question, and, and then a lot of people wonder why. Why are, why are they not ending abortion? Why are they not, are, are, are they not doing that? And that, that's a whole other conversation. Reality is the quality of people who run for office is very, very low. And they, all they care about is re-election. That's all they care about. So they're not going to do something controversial. They just want to ride the fence, and they want to try to not make any enemies so that their next election cycle is easy as possible. That's just the reality of it. Okay, I'm done with that one. Number two. Okay, so this educate your circle of influence. And this, so the next few points are going to be aimed directly at us and you. Okay, so I harped on them, now I'm going to harp on us. Educate your circle of influence. Um, and educate yourself. So bring this issue up at your church. Talk to your pastor about it. Bring it up at your Bible study, Sunday school, uh, whatever organization you're a part of, your buddies at work. Have four or five guys over to your house for coffee to talk about abolition, to talk about ending abortion. Be deliberate in educating your circle of influence. And it doesn't really matter who you are. If you're, if you're a homeschool mom that's on a homeschool mom Facebook group or whatever, do it there. If you're in high school, do it with your friends. It, there, there's no excuse to not educate a, your circle of, influ, of influence about this. And it's going to take boldness. But we know the Bible teaches us that righteous are as bold as lions. And that's what we're going to have to start doing. We're going to have to step up. Step up and be very, very bold about this. Now, the reason you're doing this, there's a, there's a point behind it, because you may go talk to 20 people and you may find three that are interested in getting involved. That's fine. Because you're building your team. You're building your, le- your lobbying team, your active team. So educate your circle of influence. Also educate yourselves when you do that. So a good example of that is uh, not too long ago, there was some liquor law going on. I don't really care anything about liquor, and it was some do-nothing law anyway, but all these liquor stores from my my district started calling me, being like, hey, will you vote for this bill? And I was like, well, why? I just needed to know why. I don't even remember what the bill was about. And they were like, well, uh, because the association sent us a letter and told us we're supposed to call you and tell you to vote for it. Nobody could tell me why this bill was a good bill. They just weren't educated about it. Do you think that had an impact on me? I'm like, what? you don't even know what you're talking about. So we need to be very educated. Again, that is what I want to do with Liberty Rising is try to educate people. Free the States does great with it. All of, everything you've heard today is great education. Write it down. Remember it. So that was number two, educate your circle of influence. Number three, get actively involved. So you need to build a relationship with your state senator and representative so that you can be more effective in your lobbying. It makes it very hard for a state senator or state uh, representative to vote no on a bill if they have a relationship with a constituent that is very passionate about the bill. So if your state senator, if your local officials don't know you by name, you haven't done enough. That's all there is to it on an issue like this. They need to know you by your first name. They need to know your phone number when you call them, whether it be their office or their cell phone. So, and a lot of us aren't there, and that's fine. That's what we're going to change because there's a storm coming, and this is part of it. Okay, so you're going to send them an email. And again, everything I'm talking about, come to the table, pick up a checklist. It's all over there, okay? Send them an email, call them, set up a meeting with your individual legislator who, who represents you, both your state senator and both your state representative. Set up a meeting with them. It can be at coffee, in the, over coffee, back in the district on the weekend, or you can come to Oklahoma City and take them out to dinner. Either way, it's going to take 
five to six phone calls to actually get them to commit to go to meeting with you. Stay on it. Keep calling, keep emailing. They need to know you are a voter and you've got, again, what did we do first? We built our team. So there's actually now a group of voters that want to talk to them that's immediately going to get their attention. They're like, uh-oh, that's, they don't want that, okay? The average legislator wants to come to Oklahoma City, do their thing, go to their dinners, play the game, feel awesome about themselves, have people open doors for them, yada, yada, and then go back and tell everybody that they're, they're just awesome, basically, is what they want to do. So as soon as, as soon as the constituents, the voters, get involved, they don't like that. And they're like, well, okay, something's, something's happening here. I need to, need to pay attention. So set up a meeting with your legislature. This initial meeting needs to be really introductory in nature, okay? Don't set up a meeting and come down and just drop the hammer on them. Don't do that, okay? Build a relationship. It needs to be introductory in nature. Who are you? What, who are they? What is, it that they're in, what is it that they're passionate about? Is it Second Amendment stuff? Is it, no, is it low taxes stuff? What is it? Build, build a relationship, right? Um, now, you're going to bring up abolition during that meeting, but it needs to be a kind, cordial meeting. Not flattery. Don't do that. Okay, but it is introductory in nature. And then you're going to slowly bring up, have you heard about abolition? What's your stance on the pro-life deal? You can even use the term pro-life, and then when oh, I'm absolutely pro-life, then you can start pressing that. But just keep in mind, you're trying to build a relationship here. Okay, so this is not a confrontational meeting. Now, when you do this, um, all legislators are going to fit into four categories, and you can write these down. One of them, they're ignorant. It means they have no idea about abolition. They don't know the difference between pro-life and abolition. And there's people up there like that. I was like that. When, uh, when in 2016, Russell Hunter and Josh Malone came to my office and we talked, I had no idea what they were talking about. It only took about five minutes, and then I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. This is correct. Let's go this way. Don't expect that from any of your representatives. Just don't, okay? Um, but it is possible. It's a possibility, and you want to make sure you don't squelch that possibility out. You want to make sure that, that that is a possibility. So they may be ignorant. They may be a hypocrite. They may know exactly what they can do to stop abortion, and they're just not. There's a lot of hypocrites in that building, okay? Just be aware of that. They may be a coward. There's cowards, too. There is. Um, whenever they voted down Senate Bill 13, I had, there was multiple senators came up to me in tears. And they apologized for killing it. They knew they had a conscience. They knew what was right. They knew what was wrong. But they were just cowardice. And then you may run into an abolitionist. We have one in Oklahoma. So there's that. Um, so, so keep in mind, the power that you carry as an active constituent is huge. Legislators fear nothing more than engaged, educated, influential constituents because you have the ability to vote them out of office, and that's all they care about. It's not that they're passionate about actually ending abortion, but it doesn't matter. We don't really need them to be passionate about that. We just need them to vote properly. So keep that in mind. You have a power. You need to wield it as a good citizen of a republic. And it doesn't really matter where you fit into society. Um, if you're a pastor, Great. They really don't like pastors that get involved because pastors already have an audience. They also really don't like when business owners get involved because they're in, engaged in the, in the business world, right? And that's going to that's gonna hamper them. But, but even if you're a stay-at-home mom, I've had senators come into my office all worked up because some stay-at-home mom is on Facebook hating on them because they're not supporting an abolition bill, and their wife heard about it, and all of their friends are like, wait, is he not behind this, and yada, yada, yada. So it doesn't matter. You can, you can be effective whatever your status is. And so you need to be sure to do that with, again, engaging your circle of influence. Um, 
So, and, and to really hammer down on this, so there was four senators who voted in favor of Senate Bill 13. And I use this as an example. I voted for it, another guy voted for it because he just would, because that's how he is. But then there, there was only two more. So one of them was Senator Chris Kidd, who actually Dusty Devers is in his district. I wouldn't want to be representing Dusty Devers if I didn't like abolition, right? So I went in and Dusty was on him. One person, one pastor from his district forced him to cast a yes, yes vote. And I watched. On the Senate floor, Senator Kim David, the floor leader, try to talk Senator Kidd out of voting yes for 20 minutes. But she couldn't overcome the power of an educated constituent. Just one. Imagine if there was 10. Same thing with the other guy who voted in favor of it, Roland Peterson, Senator Peterson. He wasn't super educated on all this stuff. I'd talk to him, but he just, just wasn't really clicking. The morning, the morning of, I called an abolitionist who's a lawyer, a business owner, very politically involved in Eden. I said, hey, I need your guy to vote yes on this bill. He said, okay, I'll call him on his cell phone. He will. And he did. He didn't even question it. One, one constituent, again, that's the power that we as constituents have that we don't use. And the reason is, is because... State Senate elections and state representative elections a lot of times only come down to a couple hundred votes. And so they know that if just a couple groups of 10 people are going to swing the next election, if they really get ticked off, that's why they listen to constituents. And to keep in mind, if you take a team with you, if you take a, five people from your church to go talk to them about abolition, it's going to be even more effective. That was point number three. Last point is for, point number four, which is stay involved. Commit to the long haul. This is going to take a while. Not too long, because I have no intention of becoming the pro-life movement where we're just doing this for 50 years. This needs to be done soon, within, within a couple election cycles. In Oklahoma, abortion should be illegal that quickly. So... Don't just show up to the rally once or send over a couple emails and lose touch with them. This needs to be consistent pressure throughout the year, even out of session. So when they're not in session at the Capitol, when they're at home, great. They're at home. Use that to your advantage. Keep calling them. Keep emailing them. And I've got details, again, over there. Pick them up and take them. Um, and a lot of people don't like meeting with legislators. They don't because they've got a big office, there's, they throw around a bunch of legal jargon. They're not pleasant people to talk to, to be honest. They're just not. But you got to understand, it was set up that way. Those offices in that building are set up to where when a constituent comes in, you immediately feel less of a person. Everything about the office, the furniture, everything about what he's wearing, Everything is set up to put him above you and mess with your psych psychologically mess with you. Don't buy into that. Don't buy into that because I promise you, you are so much more well-educated than they ever will be when it comes to this. It's not even funny, for real. So don't buy into that. So, and again, resources over there about applying consistent pressure. So, and at consistent pressure, don't stop, okay? You've, you've built a relationship. Well, first, you've built your team, you've built a relationship, and now you're starting to engage actively. Now, when you start to engage them, when you start to meet with them, and you start to talk about abolition more, they're, they're going to throw around a couple things, some, some objections. I'm going to go over them real quickly. Again, go get, pick up a sheet. They're over there, too. They're going to tout other abortion bills, heartbeat bill, ultrasound bill, Down syndrome bill, all these other bills. Well, we did this and this. Last week, they voted in favor of five abortion bills, and then they killed the only one that would actually end abortion. And what they need to know is any pro-life bill that does anything other than abolish abortion and provide equal justice is actually making matters worse. And it's actually worse than pro-choice legislation. And you need to tell them that. And they need to hear it from you 
the constituent. They'll also say abolition is unconstitutional. That's because they've never read the Constitution. Um, I'm serious. I've got stories about that. They haven't. Um, anyway, and you, you, they'll say, well, we can't do that. It's unconstitutional. You're like, no, it's not. Roe v. Wade's unconstitutional. Abortion itself is unconstitutional. This bill is the only thing in this entire area that is constitutional. And they're not, they're not going to like when you say that, but they, they need to hear it. And that, but that'll be one of their deals. Um, they'll say abortion calls for secession. No, it doesn't. Read the bill. They probably haven't read the bill either because that's not what they do. They'll say abolition will put all mothers who have abortions in prison for the rest of their lives. They'll, they'll play on the emotional side of things. No, it doesn't. All it says is abortion is murder and will be treated as such. Really, who gets in trouble for it? It's up to the prosecution. It's up to the judicial system. The example I give is if there's an adolescent girl who's in an abusive relationship, gets pregnant, the abusive boyfriend forces her to have an abortion, is a prosecutor going to come down on her? Probably not. Will the prosecutor come down on the doctor and the abusive boyfriend? Probably. Should they go to jail? Absolutely. Now, if it's like a 35-year-old career woman who's six months pregnant and she realizes that if she doesn't get rid of the baby, she's going to lose a job promotion, should she get in trouble? Yeah. But again, abolition bill just applies this equally. It doesn't say anything about that. Abolition doesn't allow for a mother's life to be saved if the pregnancy is dangerous. They'll say that one too. That's not true either. Abolition bill just charges doctors to treat all lives equally. Nothing stops them from performing basic medical triage. If a mother and a two-year-old child come in from a car accident rolling on the emergency room, does that doctor have legal cover to be like, well, that's a baby, so I don't care. I'm going to go save the mom. No. He's charged to uphold his Hippocratic Oath and actually treat both lives equally and do everything he can, exhaust all medical resources to keep both humans alive. And that's all that we're trying to do. Oh, one of my, I can't believe this one's come up. Abolition would create backroom unsafe abortions. Murders are unsafe and bad, but we don't like say, okay, if you want to kill somebody, just make sure you do it with a certain caliber gun and you're within a block from the hospital. I mean, that's ridiculous. Murder is a bad thing. And are people going to be murder? Is there going to be back room, uh, back alley abortions? Probably. But just because there's going to be doesn't, well, let's go ahead and make it legal so that we can kill these babies safe. It's just absolutely ludicrous. And then lastly, we need to overturn Roe v. Wade first. Well, if Roe v. Wade was overturned today in Oklahoma, abortions would go on perfectly fine because of the pro-life legislation that has been enacted is what is making abortions legal. So that's not true. So really, Roe v. Wade needs to be ignored, and we ignore the Supreme Court on other matters already, but we can't do it on this one. Why is that? Now, if you do want to overturn Roe v. Wade, the only way to do it is to actually send them a bill of equal protection. That's a whole other deal. And so that's what the, the, our pro-life community you know, folks, they're like, well, you got to overturn Roe v. Wade, but they won't back a bill that would actually do it. So it's complete hypocrisy. So, but keep in mind, 95% of the time, they haven't read the bill. And they're probably not going to read the bill. You're going to have to explain it to them. That's the way, that's the way they work. Now, going, go into it. These meetings and this relationship is not going to be fun, pleasant relationship. It's not. They're not really going to like you, okay? They don't have to. But, it, but it, you still have to build a relationship and you still have to provide con consistent pressure. So to recap real quickly, one, accept the legislature is bad. Two, educate your circle of influence. Three, get actively involved. And then four, stay involved consistently. It may seem like a lot of work. When you go pick up those handouts that we have over there, you're going to be like, wow, this, is, this isn't a lot of work. But really when you look at it, 10 to 15 minutes per week, maybe a couple hours a month, you can make a massive difference in pushing your legislature to actually end abortion. A massive difference. But even if it did take more than that, isn't it worth it? So I had a guy, I spoke at a church yesterday, and he said, so if we get this going, is there like a small group of legislators up there who are kind of getting behind this idea? I said, no, absolutely not, and there never will be. We will not have a majority 
of abolitionists that make up the state government? Probably ever. But it doesn't matter because they don't need to be. We just need maybe 3% of the population to be active, involved, and push them to do it, and they're going to do what they're told with the right numbers. So don't look to the legislature like, oh, if we could just elect enough people. No, it doesn't matter. You need a bill, and then you need active, focused, engaged constituents. That's the way you're going to get it done. So in conclusion, it does seem like an unachievable goal to end abortion, but it's not. We know the God we serve. Look at the Old Testament stories of Noah, Joseph, Moses, David. More recently, we weren't really supposed to win the Revolutionary War. We weren't really supposed to defeat the Nazi war machine, but we did. And what's so fascinating about this, this movement here is spreading so fast, so incredibly fast. 2016, Senate Bill 1118 was the first abolition bill ever to be filed in the nation. Now we've got seven states that have already filed it. I went to Maryland the other day. Maryland is working on it. They have a delegate up there. And I'm just like, that's the most, that's crazy liberal. But, but they're doing it. So there's this, and the legislature knows there's a storm coming. They know. They're just wondering how long they can, uh, they can avoid it. So the way we look back on slavery as a dark time in our history, our goal needs to be for our children to look back on abortion as a dark time in our history. So here's the thing, and really hone in on this. When abortion's illegal, which it will be in my generation, I'll be alive when it is illegal for sure. And my children and grandchildren ask me what, well, let me, let me do it this way. When your grandchildren and your children ask you what your role was, what role did you play to end abortion, what are you going to be able to tell them? Because I know a lot of folks are going to be like, well, nothing. We didn't think we could do anything because the Supreme Court said you could kill your baby. I don't want to be in that position. I want to be able to say, well, here's what we did. Here's what we did as a church. Here's what we did with these pastors. Here's what, here's what we did. This is how we actively got involved to make it happen. Because we all have a role to play. Everybody's got a role to play here. And it's all going to be different. So some of us have, there's a lot of pastors here. You have a large circle of influence. Capitalize on that. Some of you in this room are probably going to run for office, and you're going to win, and you're going to work, work it that way. Some of you guys are just going to campaign for people. Some of you are blessed financially, and you're going to fund some of these organizations. But all of you, everybody in this room, needs to be building a relationship with their legislator. They need to know you by your first name. Because if the church comes together and attacks this head on, that's how we're going to end it. And that's what we're trying to help with Liberty Rising. So in closing, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a pastor and theologian in World War II, who died in the Flossenburg concentration camp, once said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless, not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. Then he went on to say, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of the victims of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. And we need to take his cue and we need to attack this abortion holocaust just like that. That's all I've got to say. Russell, we may be doing a Q&A. probably sat there and said, oh, he covered most of the things that I'm wondering about, but not that one thing that I'm wondering about. So we don't have a lot of time, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. We just really want a few solid questions that maybe think about your question and say, is my question really a question that's going to be edifying to other people? But generally, if you have a great question, somebody else has that question, and they're thinking it as well. So we'll just take a few questions that we're just going to let uh, Joseph just, just tee them off.
to expand into some areas. Um, yeah, raise your hand, and, and Rachel or James will come. And, uh, and after we see Rachel bow down here, Woody, sorry, down here, after him. He's chick. Yeah, so he asked, would it be smart to go after city councils as well, or would it be a waste of time? No, definitely do that, and petition your city council to say, hey, as a city, as this governing authority, let's say that we're not going to allow abortions within our city. That's a, absolutely, you, you follow these steps and build your legislative team, because city councils, that's the same thing, they're elected as well, right? They're going to respond just like that. So definitely go after your city council, but don't stop there. If you want to go after your city council, go for it, also go after your state government, but it would be very effective to do, because if multiple cities in whatever state you're in start to say, okay, no abortions within our city limits, then that's going to send a, an additional message to the legislature being like, oh, okay, so now there's whole cities saying that we're not going to do this. So it will be very effective. So do that, but also go after your state senator and state rep. And while we're getting the next question, if you text abolition to 66866, I know that's a lot of sixes. I didn't, I didn't, pick, I didn't pick that number. Uh, you're going to be signed up on an email. You're going to get a reprompt. And you can reply with your email. It's going to go to Liberty Rising so we can pump out more information to you. Just repeat. Okay, microphones aren't, microphones aren't working, so I will repeat the question and call them out. Okay, so his question was, how do you respond to a representative who won't even discuss the issue? There's a lot of them like that, like Senator Julie Daniels, which James talked about. Um, so what you're going to need to do is you're going to make your legislative team bigger. Um, so if your senator or your representative will not talk to you, great. Get like 15 people and say, hey, we've got 15 voters that want to talk to you then they're going to start getting the picture or get some pastors or some business owners or, or, or just expand your circle of influence and educate them, right? So just get more people to help apply pressure. Because it is true, it is easy to ignore one constituent. It's easy to ignore two or three. But once you start getting more and more, they're going to be very reluctant to not go to a dinner or have coffee with like 15 to 20 constituents, especially if there's some pastors involved or some business owners involved or something like that. So, so do the groundwork at home and try to build that team big enough to, because eventually, and it's going to be different for everybody. If you have five people, then they'd be like, okay, yeah, we need to meet. It may take like 20. So it just depends on which legislature, but start building your team. And eventually there's going to be a threshold where they'll meet with you. Bill. And, uh, and he told him the reason he voted no on SB 495 was that the severability matter would not be recognized by liberal judges and therefore we could lose, we know this is not true, lose our, all of our pro-life gains as they would call it. Would you speak to the issue of severability? Is Senator Haste accurate that a, that a liberal court could go around that? No, not at all. And Bradley Pierce, is, I think, is talking tomorrow, and he'll probably address that also. But no, so, so basically what he's talking about is, is an abolition bill says we got to get rid of all these pro-life legislation, which is setting up the legal avenues to have an abortion. Say it's illegal. When you do that, I mean, you can't do both. You can't say, hey, abortion's murder, but then also have all these pro-life laws on the books. You have to get rid of them. So what he's talking about is, well, what if this goes to court and they uphold the pro-life repealers but they strike down the part that calls it murder and says it's illegal. Well, they can't do that. So basically, he's lying. And you will be lied to a lot. So get ready for it. Now, the be and your best course of action here, hook up with Liberty Rising, hook up with Free the States. James, I mean, they write very good articles in response to We hope to be able to get some of that information out as well. So that goes back to... If you get a response like that, educate yourself. Call Russell, call James, Riley, myself, anybody. My cell phone number's over there, so go get it, and we'll tell you, well, here's the correct answer. Now, the problem is, you're gonna, like, if you responded to that, 
then he'll probably just not respond. He'll be like, well, crap, they know that was a lie. Or they'll just jump to a different one. And so it's just going to be that way. And get, be prepared for that. Don't get discouraged because they're going to keep coming up with excuse after excuse after excuse. And they're slowly being backed up to a ledge. Actually, they're really quickly being backed up to a ledge. They're running out of excuses. But they will lie about that. But the inseverability thing is completely false. A question. So if we were to run for office... Like, you defeated an incumbent Democrat your first term, right? Yeah, he was in the House, so he wasn't necess- a perfect incumbent, but he was already in office for a few years, yeah. How would you go about it, like, if nobody knows us, and, like, how do you get known in the community and run for office and win? Yeah, so running for office, come talk to me about it afterwards. So basically, if you're interested in running for office, so I was a nobody when I ran, and is, you can run a solid campaign, and here in Oklahoma... This past year, two eight-year Senate incumbents were defeated. One of the major issues during those campaigns was that they voted against Senate Bill 13. There were some other things, but that was one of the central deals. So incumbents can be defeated. Even if you're nobody and have no money, you can still run a solid campaign. And there's other strategies, like if you get like five people to run against an incumbent, he's probably going to be pushed into a runoff. And so you can actually beat them that way. And actually, some liberals have done that to try to get into office so we can kind of take their playbook and use it. But if you want to get involved, I can, I mean, come talk to me afterwards. I can tell you the steps to make, and we can help you, help you do that. Joseph, question from your father. Yeah, this is my dad, everybody. So, uh, so they played their sneaky games up there, shot down SB 495 early. Senator Hamilton had considered pulling the bill, but after peripheral consideration decided, let's just put this out there. Is there anything left that can be done other than maybe a House bill this session in Oklahoma? Yeah, possibly. So they did. So, and I know it was talked a little bit about. So Senate Bill 4, so they went five years in a row without even talking about an abolition bill, just ignoring it. Like, let's just pretend like that doesn't exist. Then this year they were like, hey, I have an idea. Let's stack the Health and Human Services Committee to make sure it's going to go down zero to 10 so that it just kind of squashes everything. So that was their strategy this year. And I talked to a lot to Senator Hamilton, and there was a thought of laying the bill over, uh, which they wouldn't have liked at all because it, it didn't kind of just let it die in their, in their little trap. But it, it, unfortunately, we heard it. It died. So now what do we do? Uh, there is a couple things we can do. You can, take a, you can take a bill if we can find one in the same title of law and put in new language. Um, The problem with that is they're going to say, well, that wasn't the original language, and it gives them arguing points to an uneducated constituent. They're like, oh, well, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So you might be able to do that. There's nothing in the House. Um, So this year it's going to be very, since 495 died, it's going to be very difficult to get a bill resurrected uh, of abolition. And even if we do, it's going to be much harder to to argue for because they do have some kind of, legal jargon that they can deceive their constituents with. Um, but next year we'll try to find a bill in the House and the Senate. But So there's options. Um, they're not great options, but we're definitely going to try. Hey, Joseph. First off, a statement, then a question. Uh, the statement is later this week we're actually, and we have the paperwork in process right now, to start the first that I'm aware of. Um, abolish abortion organization to lobby Native American tribes with the ruling on us being on reservation lands here in Oklahoma I think it could have some implications there Uh, my question is what are your thoughts on those who are part of the Native American community doing the same thing within their tribe so that we might be able to bolster um, the response within our state Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Uh, It's a great idea, and I've actually thought about that because it is true that a lot of the Native American tribes are actually really family-oriented, and they actually do put a lot of emphasis on trying to make sure the family's not falling apart like it is everywhere. Uh, And so that could play in. Uh, They could be very, very open to that, and they kind of like when they can, you know, be like, hey, federal government, we're our own thing, so we're going to do whatever we want. And if that happens then it's going to put more pressure on the legislature because, oh, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma or whatever, they said that uh, they made a stance against abortion or whatever it may be. And so it's just more pressure on the state government. So I think it's a great idea. Right over here. Okay, last one right over here. 
we have some uh, members of our community who are uh, somewhat discouraged by what's happened the past few years, um, and they're, uh, they support abolitionism, but they are starting to kind of drift off to like the state question route. Mm -hmm. um, how would you respond to those people? Yeah, so the discouragement's gonna be the biggest thing that we're gonna have to deal with. And we're just gonna have to, have to man up and say this is gonna be a really, really tough fight because uh, the state government, they're not stopping. Okay, they're going to continue to try to set traps like they did with 495, and, and, and they're, they're a constantly moving target. And we're going to have to be really wise and not, dis not get discouraged. We're just going to have to continue to move with them. That's all there is to it. Now, as far as a state question, very, very dangerous to do that. Because uh, the problem with the state question is, historically, they always go down. Almost. Almost always. Because people don't like changing the Constitution. If it goes down, which it likely is, because to get a state question to, to pass, you gotta have a lot of money. You gotta have a huge yes campaign to convince people, hey, we need to change our constitution, right? Um, you're probably not gonna be able to make that pass. So when it fails, um, the legislature is gonna use that for about six to eight years against a bill of abolition, of a bill of abolition. They're gonna say, well, nope, the people of Oklahoma voted that down. And it's a really good arguing point because they did. The most important thing about that, we don't have to change our Constitution because Article 2, Section 5 and 7, I think, already guarantees the right to life. So abortion is already unconstitutional. The Oklahoma Constitution and the U.S. Constitution already say that you can't do it. We just need to uphold it. So don't fiddle with it. That's all I got. Thank you, guys. Now, I know there were other questions, and that's why he's got a table over here. Uh, it just disappeared. I believe it was 66866. <laughs> you guys have no idea how that, that was a miracle. Well, four of them were the same. Um, but anyway, other questions right over here. Um, I don't know how long he's going to be with us, but come over there. Sign up, get here on this list, and just pay attention to the things that he's doing. And again, as I said, uh, he's looking for uh, congregations to come speak to. Um, all right, so before we break for dinner, we've got special announcement presentation from uh, Pastor Brett. So come on back up. So we're about to show you a 15-minute cut of a documentary that we are making called A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plain. This 15-minute this cut is not like a 15-minute version of what the total version will be. It's really more to whet your appetite. And so hopefully you will get excited about this documentary that is coming. So we're thrilled to be a part of... Uh, there are multiple abolition documentaries that are being produced right now and that will, Lord willing, come out in 2021. So this is another one. The big idea is that it's going to show the story of the abolition movement, which really started in Norman, Oklahoma, and how it has spread through Oklahoma, and now it's in all these other states as well. So it's showing that narrative of not the wind comes sweeping down the plain, but a storm comes rolling down the plain. And we're also going to be teaching the five tenets of abolitionism within this. So this is a 15-minute cut to whet your appetite, and then Nathan will come up. Nathan is the director. He's going to come up and explain something to you for just a few minutes after you watch this. So we hope you enjoy. When I was first elected, somebody told me, they said, be careful because culture and politics change very, very slow like molasses, which is typically the case, except for this movement. It is absolutely not slow, and it has spread like complete wildfire across the nation. So as you guys can tell, the game of incrementalism that we've been playing for 47 years is completely over in Oklahoma. And looking at history, a movement like this will not slow down, and it actually cannot be stopped. This generation will end abortion, period.
you know, Hitler is said to have killed nearly six million Jews. And in America, we, we kill about six million pre-born babies, leading them to slaughter every four and a half years. So since 1973, over the past 48 years, we've killed 60 million plus babies in their most fragile place in their mother's womb. Hitler would ship the Jews to concentration camps outside of the city because at least there was some civic outrage, or could have been, and he recognized it. But here in America, we have planned Auschwitz and Trust Women's Dachau right in the same shopping center as our burger places and our cell phone repair shops and right across the street from our churches because apparently in America and here in Oklahoma it's more culturally acceptable to murder and slaughter your preborn than it is to eat a burger or to go to church. Francis Schaeffer once famously said, every abortion clinic should have a sign in front of it saying, open by the permission of the church. Proverbs 24, 11 says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Uh, what's it been since 73? So we've had, we've had almost 50 years of abortion and opposition to it. And what have we accomplished? Do we have, do we have any less abortion than we ever did? The pro-life movement essentially says we want to make abortion unthinkable. And the abolition movement says we want to make abortion illegal. The pro-life movement doesn't invest enough passion with, within its own movement that it would be motivating to say, hey, it's really important that we get out there and treat an abortion mill as a mission field. And so all of us have been just kind of brainwashed and lulled to sleep in terms of our passion, which I'm just describing apathy. First in number 70, 18, a row against Wade. Mrs. Weddington, you may proceed whenever you're ready. On January 22nd, 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that a woman had the right to an abortion and that states did not have the right to ban them. Today, in 2021, it has been 48 years since that lawless decision, and the pro-life movement has seen absolutely no success. Law after law is passed, but the number of abortions continues the same day after day. Well, this is it. It's past time for our plexit, our pro-life exit. This is the final chapter, the end of the road, a 47-year politico-religious experiment to regulate abortion that our Lord Jesus, quite frankly, has never been happy with. My mother and father signed up for ending abortion, not to a political football game without an end zone. Three years in a row, Senate Bill 13, the Abolition of Abortion in Oklahoma Act, was killed by religious leaders, legislators who go to church, 
Many are Baptists. Baptist leaders who killed bills to abolish abortion both in Oklahoma and in Texas. Megachurch pastors and denominational leaders also participated and even national right to life. All of them pro-life, all killing bills that end abortion, all in favor of situational bills that regulate and legalize child sacrifice in the womb. You're in denial. You're pretending to not hear us. You're thumbing your noses at us behind our backs. You are obstructionists. Romans 1, 29 and 32 says, Idolaters are full of murder, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's an ethical issue. It's a moral, ethical issue. You wouldn't seek to regulate the Holocaust. No one in, during the 1940s said, you know what, maybe what we ought to do is put um, limits on what Hitler's doing and tell him that he can only kill this many every year because after all we'd save some lives you know you know why why wouldn't you do that well because of the reality of the horrors of the holocaust and murder and everything that they were doing there this holocaust in america is no different we shouldn't <laughs> try to regulate this holocaust we ought to try to abolish it the one thing that i like to say to these people is you only hit what you aim for. The problem is Christians will settle for a lot less because honestly, I don't think we really care all that much. I mean, if we did, we would, we would demand it. Incrementalism is the pro-life political strategy of regulating who, when, where, why, and how abortion is not allowed. The deadly problem is the reverse is also true. Incrementalist pro-life bills also codify into law when abortion is allowed. 48 years in, the verdict has been reached. The pro-life incrementalist strategy has failed. I mean, I regard the pro-life movement myself to be anti-Christian. Not everybody in it's anti-Christian, but what I mean is the secular leadership of the pro-life movement is completely anti-biblical, anti-gospel. Does the king have anything to say to governing authorities? Well, in Psalm 82, the Lord is speaking to governing authorities, and he says, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And in our context, what it looks like for a governing authority to show partiality to the wicked is saying to a mother and an abortionist, you can kill a baby. You're telling a parent they can murder their own child with impunity. Whereas the Lord says in Psalm 82, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Say law, which means pause and meditate about that. So I would say to all governing authorities, and something that the church must say to the governing authorities is, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Pause and meditate. Think about that. And then he transitions from asking these rhetorical questions, and he says in verse 3, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Even if the federal government dictates that a state should take life under its boundaries, the state must interpose between her citizens and the federal government. And if the federal government dictates that, that its citizens should be able to take life, well, God stands over the federal government and says, what murder is and what true justice is and that you shall not murder. Now, the doctrine of interposition, first and foremost, uh, is the doctrine, really, that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brought the salvation of God to bear upon the souls of men. In other words, when Christ was on that cross, 
he peaceably laid down his body. He interposed between us and the three enemies that are against us to take us on and take us down and take us out, which is our sinful flesh, this illegitimate world system that's in rebellion against God's loving and just rule, and Satan and his demons. We have enemies arrayed against us to destroy us. And so the doctrine of interposition was first and foremost uh, expressed uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Matthew 16, Jesus tells his disciples and he tells Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church shows the power and the authority of Christ. The church goes out and wars against the gates of hell. Gates are not offensive, they're defensive, and Christ's authority will rule over the gates of his enemies. Like the slavery abolition movement of old, there has been a storm brewing, intensifying from a sprinkle to a thunderstorm. The prophetic voice of the church is rising to meet the evil of its day, and the gates of hell will not prevail when the church wields the word. So maybe, maybe you are like me, and you were pro-life, and you're thinking that you've been doing what you should be doing concerning your preborn neighbors, your neighbors who are still in the womb. And I hope, by God's grace, you're realizing that voting for pro-life politicians isn't doing anything to rescue the weak and the needy. I hope that you see that just giving to and being a part of pregnancy resource centers is a good thing, but it is not a holistic approach to rescuing those being carried off to death. And so what I would say to you, if you still identify yourself as part of the pro-life movement that truly in the end just takes their cues from the culture, what I would say to you is repent with me. The only reason that I'm saying these things to you now is because God granted me repentance. And I saw the horrors of what's actually happening. And then God showed me through experience and through his word, showed me the truth. Repentance is turning from sin or apathy and turning to Christ Jesus, trusting in him and following him. And so what I would say to the average pro-life person is repent with me. Repent of your apathy repent of your willful ignorance concerning the fact that your pro-life politicians are actually the ones keeping abortion legal and start coming with me to the murder mills even and let's preach the gospel and interpose in every way that we can for our neighbors. Join us as we tell the story of the church rising up and demanding an immediate end to this holocaust. As we rise against the kings of this world who would have us to believe that the ultimate solution is to bow to them rather than Christ, King Jesus, join us in repenting of our apathy, lamenting of our nation's debauchery, and proclaiming Christ's kingship over our land. I can't tell you how many times I pray, Lord, if I'm on the wrong side of this, show me. Because all I want to do is obey your will. I prayed that probably 15 times. Now, why would somebody keep praying that prayer over and over again? Why would somebody keep saying, God, if I'm on the wrong side of this, please show me. God, if I'm on the wrong side of this, please show me. God, if, I mean, I've wept and cried. You know why I kept praying that? Because in my conscience, I knew I was on the wrong side of it. And finally, I had to come to a point and just say, you know what? It doesn't matter what other people think, what other people say. I've got to do, I got to, I got to do what God's word says. I got to take a stand on the truth. And so now, you know, I've never come out. I guess I could, maybe I should do it. I've never come out and said, I'm an abolitionist. I guess it's about time. So I'm an abolitionist. There you go.
I'm going to stand over here because I'm short enough. I think you guys can only see my head if I stand behind this. So my name is Nathan Weiser, and I humbly yet very proudly come in front of you today as the director of A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plain, the gospel. Hold up, what is it? When the gospel of Christ collides with the culture of death. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, it's been an incredible joy to work on this project thus far, and we're not done at all. Um, it's been incredible to get to sit down with people who I truly consider to be heroes of the faith. Um, these opportunities, just for me alone, have been life-changing. And I say that not to make this about me, but just that I have an incredible opportunity here to stand in front of everyone and publicly thank God for sovereignly electing that I serve this purpose for his glory. So now that I have all of the Calvinists convinced that they need to donate to this project, <laughs> let me tell you what it's about. How many of you have seen American Gospel? So if you've seen that, you'll probably agree with us that documentary filmmaking is a medium that God is really using to show the church what it needs to open its eyes and realize. Our mission is to reach that pro-life Christian that has not thought about it. Um, this, what we made today, is you know kind of bound by the context that we wanted you guys to see it and have your appetite be wet. But we're going to have an hour and a half documentary, which that's our plan, that's our goal, that really reaches to that person, the church-going, life church member who just hasn't thought about it or hasn't as Brett said, is willfully ignorant. And we're going to set that up, and we're really going to make that obvious. That they're like, yeah, I have been willfully ignorant, because we've all been there. Um, further, our documentary has three main goals. The first is to introduce the church to the biblical doctrine of abolitionism. The second is to tell the story of the abolitionist movement in Oklahoma. And the third is to provoke the church to action, specifically towards gospel-centered movement, or involvement in the legislative process and interposition at the abortion mills. So just to be clear, this wasn't the final version. I know we've already said that, but just want to get that across. Um, this documentary will feature a lot more voices. Um, Pastor Jeff Durbin is going to be involved. Um, we've got T. Russell Hunter and all of the guys in Free the States. Um, we've got some personal stories. We've got a story of an abortion survivor who's an abolitionist. Um, and a mother who chose life and is now an abolition, abolitionist and is actively um, outside of the Norman um, mill interposing. And uh, we're, our goal is to widely distribute this you know, in, a, in an on-demand uh, format at first and then on a platform, which we're still deciding on. Um, I want to introduce the partners who's been involved in this so far. The original screenplay, this is really, I'm kind of the slave to his vision here. Um, the original screenplay and the executive producer is Dusty Devers. Um, it is co-written and executive produced by Brett Baggett. The color and principal photography is by my business partner, Logan Filkins. And it's gonna be narrated by the sultry golden chords of Tim Gillespie. So uh, the reason why I'm here um, is to whet your appetites, get you guys excited about it, but we do need funding. Um, we want to make the best possible product that we can. We want, our goal is to have an original soundtrack, um, high quality motion graphics and animation, high quality mixing and mastering, which that's a way bigger deal. If you guys are into that, that's a way bigger deal than you think. Um, and we want to get this in front of eyeballs, so we want widespread marketing, and that all takes funds, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so share this project with as many people as you can, you know, get people excited about it. Uh, you can find the GoFundMe by, oop, do we have the QR code? Is that thing? Oh, it's not a big deal. Um, if you want to find the GoFundMe, uh, it's plastered all over Facebook. I think the, the QR code's fixing to show up. You can talk to me, Dusty, Brett. Um, Tell your friends to use some of their earnings from the GameStop and Dogecoin stuff and send half of it our way and then send the other half to Matthew Wasserima and his documentary. Thank you very much.
I'm glad that there was a lot of space that you talked there, because it's like, man, if I have to go up there, I'll be like crying again, and I don't do that in front of crowds. But no, I mean, for those of y'all who follow that, just to see that thing end with Blake Gideon, like that's, that's going to be very, very powerful. And we're, we're watching and praying and hoping and just, you know, he's become, it's weird. Blake, Blake Gideon's like become a friend of mine. I like, talk to him every day. Like, it's crazy. So, well, go, so be prepared for that future. Um, but no, uh, you know, we're free of the states. We put these things on, but we are so, so thrilled about the multiplication of different organizations, different things that are happening. And um, please pour in, help, support these, these things. I don't know if these guys know that they got together and made a church repent documentary, but... <laughs> <laughs> Zing. No. <laughs> Just, <laughs> well, it didn't, it wasn't going to be done from the parking lot. Well, there's going to be some, some guy in an AHA hoodie showing this in the parking lot of a church somewhere, and you're going to be like, that, that wasn't the intention, but whatever. Um, no, all joking aside. So we're going to break um, for dinner. We wanted to kind of modify some things to make sure. I know that fellowship is such a good part of this, and um, talking to people that you're just meeting and that sort of stuff, preparing for tomorrow. Um, we want to come back and start the next session up here at 6. Um, I will say, as my wife has been out there, the roads are pretty gross, um, so please be careful out there um, going to get dinner and that sort of thing. Um, I would ask you, you're all here, and there's going to be Tons of temptation between now and tomorrow morning for people not to come to Abolition Day. It's cold. Uh, it's rainy. It's dangerous because you could die from the Rona, all these things. Um, and let's just, I mean, kind of like that, kind of like I guess John was saying, John Speed was saying in there, it's like, I just don't think we care enough. I think that we're trying to care enough. We're ceasing to do evil and learning to be good, but I don't think sometimes we, the abolitionist movement, even realize how sinful and selfish and lazy, just real indolent towards our neighbor's plight we are sometimes. And I can tell you, for one, I know that I would not want to wake up and be at the Capitol, uh, but I kind of have to be there. So that's the way I keep myself accountable. Um, but, so I would ask you to, during this dinner time thing, you know, if you like to go live on Facebook or make videos or anything like that, please post reminders. Invite people to Abolition Day. Get people there. Because, see, the deal is, is everything that Senator Silk was saying about creating relationships and, and all that kind of stuff is very important. But one of the things that's going to help those relationships is the legislature seeing the body of abolitionists grow and spread. And when they go, it's really, really cold, and it's really, really sleety and rainy and all that kind of stuff, ah, this is great. And then they look out, and there's a massive amount. It's going to count even that much more. So let's count it as a blessing that it's cold. Um, one other thing, we need 10 more volunteers for tomorrow. The perks are you get to volunteer for tomorrow and you get a badge. You get like a name badge or something. I don't know what those volunteers are going to be doing. Probably just help facilitating crowd control and that sort of thing, handing materials out. Um, there's, we're just expecting a large crowd even though. Um, but I think, Rachel, are you over there? Rachel and Casey. Rachel and Casey. Okay, so Casey right here and Rachel right there. They're standing up. They're basically coordinating. Like everything... Everything that's going on has been basically coordinated by these ladies, just getting everything done, okay? We should thank them. Never in my life have I received so many texts reminding me of the things that I need to do since I met Rachel. I love her for it, and a lot of stuff is happening, and she's not doing that with just me, but with everybody. And so... They're getting things done. They need some volunteers. Go over there and talk to them and um, be safe out there on the roads and come back by 6. And we will start promptly at 6. So, all right.